Test one, two.
Good afternoon, everyone. Well, this is your one minute warning. Good afternoon, everyone. I will begin uh, the meeting today with our territorial acknowledgement. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather, land on which we are broadcasting from today, is the land traditionally cared for <clears throat> by the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral people. We also acknowledge the enduring presence and deep traditional knowledge and philosophies of the Indigenous people with whom we share this land today. I also have two moments of reflection. The first one is reading this council statement on behalf of uh, council in the city of Waterloo. Um, Monday, March 12th, it's the International Day of Norwaz. Today, March 20th, is Narwa, sorry, now, now Ruse. <laughs> sorry, I pronounced that wrong, now Ruse. Also known as the Parisian New Year, this is an annual celebration that marks the arrival of spring, rebirth of nature, and a new year. This means a new day for more than 30 million people around the world with origins in the Middle East, Central Asia, Baha'i, and Ishmali communities. This day is a reminder for all of us to consider the cultural, culture of peace behind this celebration through everyday dialogue and solidarity. It is an opportunity to reaffirm our commitment to human rights and dignity, respect and reconciliation, and live with consciousness of nature by upholding environmental pr protections. There are many ways that observers celebrate Noroz, some complete a 19-day fast from sunrise to sunset with a focus on daily prayers and reflection. And, some, and for some, the day is a non-religious celebration that is a time to celebrate new beginnings. As family and friends and neighbors gather, dress up, and celebrate with prayers, food, dancing, and music, we recognize the rich cultural heritage and diversity. The hope for a more peaceful, sustainable world and compassion for more inclusivity among all humans are values also shared by Ramadan traditions. So the second council statement today is on Ramadan. Today, we also take this time and acknowledge and honor the members of our community who are, participate, or who are preparing to observe the auspicious month of Ramadan. Beginning this Wednesday, March 22nd, Muslims around the world will observe the month-long time of reflection, contemplation, and celebration. Ramadan is one of the holiest months of the year for those who follow the Islamic faith. It is a special time of spiritual connection for Muslims through prayer and fasting from dawn to dusk. Many attend mosque services, and there is a great deal of emphasis on charity and outreach during this time. It is also a time for families to come together to share a pre-dawn meal and the evening meal together. We join together in support of our Muslim neighbors by being mindful of the needs of those who are fasting and spending additional time in prayer. May this month of Ramadan offer many opportunities for reflection, showing gratitude, and time spent with loved ones. So, Council, the um, welcome everyone. Um, just we, if, if anyone has a disclosure of pecuniary interest, um, please disclose that at this time and the general nature of that. Seeing none. I'll need a mover and a seconder for the approval of the February 13th council minutes. 
moved by Councillor Hamner, seconded by Councillor um, Roach. Yeah, all in favor? That is unanimous, thank you. Um, next we move to the delegations and presentations. And we will start with the lot maintenance bylaw update. Matthew Reckman, who is, lives in Waterloo, and Tom Woodcock, who also lives in Waterloo, are here with the presentation on, um, on lot maintenance bylaw update. Welcome, Matthew. It's a pleasure to see you again. And, um, and hello to Tom Woodcock. Thank you both for joining us this afternoon. And we, you have 10 minutes, and we will uh, turn it over to you. Go ahead. Mayor and members of council, my name is Matthew Reckman, and I'm here to speak, to speak to you today about Waterloo's lot maintenance bylaws and urban biodiversity. I first want to thank council and staff for my appointment to the Sustainability Advisory Committee. However, my time here today is as a private citizen, and in no way am I speaking for or on behalf of the Sustainability Advisory Committee. Last spring, I began a small campaign called Beyond No Mo May to raise awareness regarding the city's lot maintenance bylaws and the environmental, uh, environmentally negative double standards they represent. We wrote a web page to help educate citizens, a petition which gained over 100 signatures as well as the support and signatures of some of the current council, endorsement from local PhD ecologists, local groups, and an international organization. Um, sorry, I'll just slide, make sure that works. Urban uh, ecosystems and their benefits. Um, ecosystem services are the benefits provided by intact, healthy ecosystems. They are in part water and air purification, aquifer regeneration, carbon sequestration, lowered urban heat island effect, flood, flood and erosion control, waste cleanup, pest control, pollination for growing our food, both urban and rural, and natural areas also provide opportunities for education, uh, re uh, relaxation, and can have historical value and have known positive mental health benefits. The Waterloo's uh, bees and beyond, Within 10 kilometers of where we sit today, citizen scientists with the app iNaturalist have been able to identify over 2,000 species of invertebrates uh, at the research grade level. Of those species, 59 are considered threatened. Also, there have been 41 species of bee that have been recognized within 10 kilometers of here, uh, vastly a very low, un likely a very low undercount as the GTA has been able to count at least 350 species of bees that have been living in uh, the GTA. The same goes for the 900 species of moths and butterflies, as well as over 100 species of pest controlling wasps. This is a small sample of the creatures we've already lost in Ontario. Each one of these creatures has evolved to create unique and intricate relationships with the plant and animal communities around them. And every time we lose one of these, our ecosystem is losing another brick. And, these, and if we do not begin to proactively restore and recover what we still have, we stand to lose nearly 5,000 species of plants and animals in Canada alone. Waterloo is on the cusp of the Carolinian zone, a region comprising just a quarter of a percent of Canada's landmass, yet represents one third of Canada's rare and endangered species. And if you don't like bugs, what about songbirds? Without insect diversity, many of our birds will continue to disappear from our landscapes. All of the birds around us depend on caterpillars and other insects to raise their young. Chickadees, for example, require about up to 9,000 caterpillars just to raise one, hatchling, or one uh, clutch of young. Just to speak on the bylaws now, and that is technically an illegal lawn in the picture there, believe it or not. No owner or occupant shall have or permit to have undesirable material on their lot, says the bylaw. Undesirable material includes injurious insects, termites, rodents, vermin, and other pests. Pests has been defined in the bylaw as rodents, vermin, or insects. Certainly the city is not asking that uh, citizens eliminate every insect from their property to be in conjunction with the bylaw, as well as every flying squirrel, chipmunk, other squirrels. Uh, and how is injurious defined? It's very nebulous. The definition for undesirable material also includes turf grass of vegetation in excess of 20 centimeters. Most native plants have evolved to grow much taller, encouraging citizens in the city to mow less often, in other words, increase the turf grass limit or to naturalize, has many benefits, including increased floral and faunal diversity, reduced urban heat island effect, lower lawn watering needs, reduced carbon emissions, increased carbon sequestration, increased backyard bird diversity, reduction in certain weed and pest species, improved soil development, reduced stormwater runoff, and many more, reduced maintenance um, costs, and many more benefits. Another item defined as undesirable material is dead, decayed, or damaged trees or other natural growth and branches 
or sorry, and the branches and limbs thereof. For example, in my yard, I have a few small logs and a large stump just to provide some cover for any birds, insects, or amphibians that wish to make my yard their home. Yet under the bylaw, I am in violation. I recognize that the city has made some steps towards allowing more naturalized space in the city last year when the bylaw was reviewed. However, the bylaw still states, quote, every owner and occupant shall ensure that the naturalized area does not encroach onto any adjacent property. Every owner or occupant shall ensure that the naturalized area is maintained in a manner that does not present an unkempt or unsightly appearance. And every owner or occupant shall maintain a buffer strip around any naturalized area, that being three feet from the, prop three feet from the property line. Ontario courts have already ruled on similar bylaws. Sandra Bell maintained a naturalized yard in Toronto, yet the city found her in violation of the height bylaw. The court found that Bell's Section 2 Charter Right of Freedom of Expression was, was infringed upon. Justice Fairgreave's legal decision included, quote, There can be no doubt that Bell's act of growing a naturalistic garden that included a tall grass and weeds had expressive content, expressive content and conveyed meaning. As an environmentalist, Miss Bell implemented landscaping form intended to convey her sincerely held beliefs concerning the relationship, relationship between man and nature. It also implicitly conveyed a critique of the prevailing values reflected in conventional landscaping practices. In fact, that many the fact that many people evidently do not share Bell's environmental beliefs and disapprove of the way she chose to manifest them does not remove her chosen form of expression from the protection of Section 2, that being freedom of expression. In terms of unkempt and unsightly, they are also legally troublesome. Again, to quote Justice Fairgreave's decision, I do not accept that common sense dictates when growth of weeds and grass exceed what is necessary or necessarily right. Without a prescribed standard against which to measure such matters, it would surely become a question simply of personal taste and aesthetic preference. On the other hand, since there appears to be no obvious correlation between a height restriction for plants and any health, safety, or environmental hazards posed by them, I think the new bylaw makes it even clear that the city's concern with weed, city's concerned with weed control is primarily motivated by aesthetic considerations. In Counter v. Toronto, Toronto mowed the poll pollinator garden on the boulevard of the counters. Ruling, uh, the ruling and following appeal by the counters was upheld that the city was in its right to protect the sight lines of the road and sidewalk users. However, we ask that the city recognize that sight line impedances are already permitted and naturalized areas are being unfairly targeted. Vehicle street parking is a far greater physical impedance to sight lines. There's street trees, snow banks, transformer boxes. They also pose risks but are seen as essential parts of inf infrastructure. I hope that the city can recognize that naturalized space is an essential green infrastructure that we need to protect as well. Why are these small spaces so important? Because every yard, boulevard, and roadside that we can convert into an undisturbed naturalized space provides feeding, mating, nesting, shelter, and overwintering habitat. As an example, the two pictures on the left are of a ligated furrow bee that was literally a foot from my front door. A tiny space, yet it is providing benefits. Just to review, I'd like to, or just, I would like to review a few of the city's commitments as they apply today. In 2018, the city was recognized as a B city with programs such as the Pollinator Working Group. And this comes with conditions of continued work. In 2019, there was an environmental emergency declaration with a commitment to reduce greenhouse gases in the city. The city's strategic plan also states, all actions and decisions are evaluated through a lens of environmental, social, and economic sustainability. Canada also made commitments at the COP15 a few months ago. At least two of those targets we can assist with as a city, those targets being 11 and 12, to restore, maintain, and enhance nature's contributions to people, and to ensure biodiversity inclusive urban planning, enhancing native biodiversity. But what can we do about it as a city? First, we need to recognize what we have. We need to, um, oh, sorry, just a second. Recognize what we have. This is a map of the city of Waterloo and its varieties of green space that we currently have. If we look to our yards and businesses, we can exponentially grow this space to improve. To quote the entomologist and author Doug Tallamy, we have not targeted these places for conservation in the past, but that was back when our conservation model was based on the notion that humans and their tailings were here and nature was someplace else. That model of mutual exclusion has failed us dismally. There simply cannot... There simply are not enough untrammeled places to sustain the natural world that until now has sustained us. Our only option then is to find ways to coexist with other species. That's right, we must con uh, construct ecosystems that contain all their functional parts right where humans abound, and this might be easier than you think, or maybe easier than you think. 
First, we need to correct the double standards existing in the bylaw. It is legal currently to plant exotic, very invasive periwinkle and ivies on your property line, regardless of how many woodlots in the cities are being destroyed by it. However, it is illegal to plant native, non-aggressive swamp milkweed within a meter of my property line. Remove, remove the conditions of unkempt and unsightly and the buffer strips. They are arbitrary and in part not legally enforceable. And follow the recommendations from experts who have advised us that bylaw departments should move to a visit when harm is present model. Complainants should be required to specify the danger or harm present before they can make a complaint. We need to further educate and help citizens and businesses to plant natives and naturalize. We could offer an alternative to homeowners to naturalize dug up areas of their boulevards after construction rather than the default sod placement. We can expand the stormwater credit program to recognize the benefit of natural yards and having reduced stormwater runoff. We create soft landings, which is to add native plantings and leave the leaves under trees to benefit the full life cycle of hundreds of different species of insects in our city. We can change current policy to require that all city plantings are at least 80% native and there's no reason that couldn't be 100%. We can, uh, we can restore and improve the natural spaces we currently have by planting more native species and removing the invasives. One thing we could do is create an urban meadows or pocket prairies program. This map that I have here is just highlighting 11 acres of examples of unused space in the city. The greenhouse gas emissions, labor, and fuel costs saved by not mowing these areas would be nice. So just so you know, you have one minute yeah. left. Research shows that these 11 acres would capture 3.3 to 18.7 metric tons of carbon annually. That would be in hydro corridors and places such as the McCormick Community Center, the Harper Branch Library, or near Mary Johnson Public School. Create something called bio, road bioswales, so vegetated depressions along roadways, kill many birds with one stone. We can, we can create traffic calming measures, slow stormwater runoff, clean stormwater runoff, as well as plant with native plants to increase bird and insect habitat. And the bylaw department already allows and gives grace period for those people practicing no mow may. They formalize, let's please formalize the practice into law and remove the arbitrary lawn height limits outright or to apply only during the summer months. And finally, let us grow and create more community gardens in our city. They are fantastic places to learn, play, teach, grow food, enjoy nature, and relax. These are my references for any of the research that I've mentioned. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Thank you very much to you both and uh, fantastic photos in there. So I Thank noticed you. that They're, a number uh, of from, those are yeah, Either from are Tom, Tom here so. or myself just at my house or the community garden that I run. Wow, amazing. Thank you so much. That, um, um, so questions, Council. Yeah, Councillor Vasek. Uh, thanks. Uh, through you, Mayor McCabe. Thanks so much for your presentation you. um, and all the work you've been uh, doing up to this point. Um, I have a question about the mowing versus naturalization. As I've been looking into this it, and asking questions, um, it sounds like you get kind of a bigger bang for your buck with naturalization versus doing a full out no mow may campaign. So can you just speak more to that if you know more about that? Absolutely. I might uh, direct to Tom here. He's a uh got more education than I do in the in the field. Um, but uh, yes, there, there's more bang for the buck as far as uh, all the benefits I had mentioned goes with naturalization. However, naturalizing your yard is not a, a cheap or free endeavor to partake in. It can take a, a lot of financial resources as well as time and energy. Um, but there are benefits to be had with no mo may. Uh, and that's why I called what I had started last spring beyond no mow may. It's a nice starting point, but if we actually want to make some positive benefits in our city and to the ecosystem, we have to go beyond and do more. But, and Tom wants to say more about that. Um, yeah, the no the no mow may is a is an excellent. Sorry, if you could just speak into oh, the microphone, thanks, Tom. Yeah, no mow may is is as Matthew says an excellent place to to begin. Um, leaving uh, spring flowers available. Um, which in an urban area I know uh, often uh, consists of, of lots of dandelions. Um, but there's, that provides food for some of the, the early emerging uh, native bee species that, that Matthew showed. Uh, when we do have areas that have been consistently mowed, you do tend to get um, more weedy species that are generally non-native and adapted to colonizing disturbed ground. But if you naturalize an area with native plants, eventually, um, as that 
community develops, it, it is able to outcompete and exclude a lot of the plants that, that people may object to, like dandelions or, or chicory or, or uh, Queen Anne's lace that are, that are non-native. <clears throat> and then you, you will get uh, much less maintenance required. Um, and you can have, for example, the stalks that can stay standing during the winter, which provide seed for birds and uh, habitat for some of those bees that nest in the hollow stems. So it's definitely sort of a, a positive um, feedback to allowing the, the biodiversity to increase on its own. Um, it's very low maintenance and it begins with a, with a no mo may, I guess. Thank you. Did you have a follow up? Um, well, I have a couple questions for staff as well. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that, for the explanation too. A really good point also about uh, the resources it takes, the time and the money to actually create a naturalized lawn. They're doing some hydros, doing some construction in front of our house right now. And I was looking at the presentation being like, oh, that would be so nice if I could naturalize that part of the boulevard. And then I immediately went, you do not have time for that, Jen. What are you talking about? So, so there is some benefit to think to, to yeah, leaving your, your yard if you can't maintain the naturalization. So I like that. I also appreciate your um, thoughts about a naturalized lawn in the stormwater credit. So maybe I'll, can we leave that idea with you? I did look up here and it says that rain gardens are considered, but they must be different things than naturalized lawns so yes so i think the commissioner of ippw has heard it and maybe can bring it back or staff can bring it back as they're exploring more so thank you for that the only oh I, just counselor just before you move on i, I see yeah. that, excuse me i see that uh nicole popke is here i don't know if you wanted to respond to anything or are you like to what Councillor vasic just raised or I can respond in general if council wishes just to um, some of the conversations Matthew, Tom, and I have had leading leading up to today's meeting, if okay. that would be helpful. Sure. Do you want to wait? Is I can it, wait. Do, I can do or I didn't know if you, I, I thought you, you wanted to jump in on that question. For me, Councillor Vasek, and then I can offer sure. some comments. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to know what the intent behind the having undesirable material in the bylaw is. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the lot maintenance bylaw, just from perspective, does cover other aspects um, in addition to just sort of some of the grass grass <coughs> items as well. So, you know, the storage of of junk and garbage and and that type of thing on a property um, that can create hazards as well. And and would you say that when you're investigating a particular property, you kind of use your your discretion, like why do you have to have all of this in there? Um, can you take some of it out and still be able to have sort of safe um, and healthy living conditions? Certainly. So I think too, just for, for a little bit of perspective, um, we came back to council last April uh, with amendments to the lot maintenance bylaw, which actually permitted naturalized areas. Prior to that, they weren't permitted within the bylaw. In addition to, um, we kind of wanted to raise the, the height of grass because we were quite restrictive in Waterloo compared to other municipalities. We did some public engagement um, at the time, made some reach outs. We hadn't met Matthew and Tom at that point until after after that. Um, so just to put a little bit of perspective on it, some of the feedback we heard um, kind of related to naturalized spaces was the buffer strip uh, and height regulations for safety and sight line. Um, so that was some of the feedback we've heard. Uh, buffer strips are certainly something that are not in every municipality, so definitely worth kind of further discussion, I would think. Uh, thanks. And along those lines, last question. Um, are, are there any further changes we might be able to expect to the lot maintenance bylaw, including for boulevards? Um, well, the boulevards are the port, port with transportation, and they are coming with a report to council, and we've actually all met with Matthew and that group as well. Um, we're not currently, we haven't been directed to change the bylaw or go back with it, so certainly there are always room for improvements and, and maybe items for clarification as well, so certainly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vasek. Um, Councillor Wright. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, I just want to go back to those pictures you had 
in your slide deck where you've got um, the Not the sure roads with particular yeah the bio soils. Um, do you know where these are from? Do you have a the, these um, pictures themselves are actually from the National Association of City Transportation Officials. Um, I don't know what city they're exactly from. Um, it's from their documents uh, that outline design and implementation of uh, this kind of infrastructure. Okay, Th thank you for that. I, I just find it really interesting because we, a good portion of Waterloo is on floodplain. And so determining how best to integrate these strategies between the, the lot maintenance aspect, but also uh, the sort of rain smart or sponge city strategy, um, those two things could be neatly harmonized. Yeah. Um, from a city perspective. Um, personally, I found this was a, a neat idea. It's um, maybe not the best uh, phrase for what I'm doing, but kill many birds with one stone. Um, I know the city has been extensively looking at uh, speed uh, within the city so as far as speed limits go. Um, I think everyone here recognizes that signs don't stop people from speeding, but it's the way roads are designed. And if we can make some road calming measures throughout the city using um, infrastructure such as this, with native plantings um, could go a long way just to start showing what you can do, what kind of beautiful native plants are out there, as well as to create some uh, habitat as well. So just as a follow-up to that, um, it does require a fair amount of, like on the, on the uh, property lot maintenance side, it does require a certain amount of education. So how do you see that unfolding? Like, is that something that would be undertaken with say reap or um, is this something that you see happening primarily through uh, municipal enforcement or where where do you see the education opportunities um, i know reap has already been doing lots of work as far as rain gardens and that goes they can probably speak more to it um, i know the city has education online about rain gardens and such but again it's very um, targeted at rain gardens um, th that information could be expanded to talk about different methods of creating naturalized space on your yard, different ways of going about planting or sowing or just um, allowing things to naturally regenerate as well with your helping hand. I feel like people who are interested in doing something like this are going to be the ones that will be happy to do some more reading and education as well and that will seek that kind of thing out. Um, they'd be, uh, it's not going to be necessarily everyone is going to be interested in this and I think that's part of the theme as far as the legal side of things go is um, it's, it's fine for people to keep, uh, keep their turf grass lawns um, regardless of how um, environmentally damaging they may be but that's what their choice that's their aesthetic but for those of us who wish to do otherwise we would like to have the freedom as well and I think the city has some good education with rain gardens and that but that could be expanded to include the whole yard. Thank you. Uh, go ahead Councillor Rowe. Through you, Chair. Um, I wanted to thank you for your presentation. I have a naturalized garden in my front yard, and it's fantastic. And um, the wildlife and the birds and even hummingbird moths that come, it's really great. So thank you very much. I would like to um, direct a question to staff specifically about um, these planting structures in terms of traffic control and speed control. And I'm wondering if that's anything we've considered with the city or if that's something that, that can be looked at. Through you, Mayor McCabe, to Councillor Rowe. Excellent question, Councillor. And um, as Nicole mentioned, um, the city's transportation division is doing a thorough review of that right now because there are some concerns with respect to sight lines, um, making sure that people see intersections and little children and uh, you know uh, obstacles and things that are within the right of way. But we also think there's an opportunity to look at um, maybe changing the current policies to allow some of this stuff on a more selective basis. And I'll add, um, building on Councillor um, Vasek's point. When the city redid our uh, stormwater master plan, we actually looked at um, these specific types of measures. And for many years on stormwater management blocks, for, for example, we, we do require that there's a, a natural seed mix that's put in place, so prairie grasses and things. We don't plant traditional turf grasses as a, as a matter of course, and we haven't done that on new developments for quite, quite some time. So it's a, an evolution, and we're certainly uh, happy to look at new ideas and how we can evolve. Do you have a follow-up? Thank you. Or? No. no. Okay, great. Thank you. Other questions from council? Um, just a quick clarification question. You mentioned that there's under trees, there's something called soft landings. What what exactly is that? Yeah, sorry. I was running short on time, so I didn't have time to 
talk extensively about everything. I'm just trying to fall back. So soft landings, um, just as an example, oak trees uh, as a genus or as a tree family um, are essential to the life cycle of almost a thousand different types of uh, species of insects and other animals um, that utilize either the roots, leaves, living in the tree um, for part of their life cycle. When we uh, mow the grass underneath our trees and parks or other parts in the city or on your own property, you're getting rid of all the natural protection that other plant life underneath can provide as well as the leaves that fall um, for winter overwintering. Um, by leaving areas or creating natural areas, areas underneath the drop line of trees, you're allowing the thousands of different insects and caterpillars that fall out of the tree to seek shelter during the winter in the ground, um, either to uh, crystallize or get ready for the spring when they emerge. Um, but when we take that away and replace it with turf grass that we maintain uh, by mowing in that, we're eliminating that part of the habitat and that part of the life cycle and uh, destroying countless thousands of uh, insects that would otherwise be contributing to the ecosystem. Thank you for that. And just a quick question because to Nicole Popke, um, on our boulevards, like in front of our in people's properties and, you know, single family homes, are we allowed, are, are staff, or sorry, are residents allowed to make changes to what's currently grassed in that area? Like, do can they just... You know, normally people um, mow all that, but like if I wanted to change my front lawn into a naturalized area, do I need to, like some of my neighbors have said, oh, you got to ask the city for permission. Yeah, through, through you, Mayor, to you, Mayor. Um, <laughs> and I've told them I'm the mayor. I'll yeah, do that would be <laughs> through transportation if there were changes that would want to be made. And I think that's where they're coming back with some alternatives to, to sort of permit that, like some permits, different changes to plantings that would be on a boulevard. Okay. Well, it sounds like we're looking forward to that report coming back then. Oh, did you have something... So we'll wait for that report to come back then. Thank you. Um, if there's no further questions, thank you very much to both of you, Tom and Matthew, for coming in. I would encourage you to not use that expression, though, because I think it's going <laughs> to kill two birds with one stone because it's going fundamentally against what you're trying to achieve here. <laughs> but but uh, I really appreciate the information. It's been, uh, it's been um, you know, I've learned a lot through this presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So our next presentation, I think these these uh, sound like they're very aligned. Mary Jane Patterson, uh, the executive director of Reap Green Solutions, and Patrick Gilbride, associate director, manager of green infrastructure programs, are here to uh, provide an update um, on their on their activities. So I think the there's a lot of synergy. I, I think that from the first presentation to the next one. So over to you. You have ten minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much um, to you, Mayor McCabe, and to all the councillors. Um, we're excited to share with you our most recent impact report and very happy to be back here in person after doing this on Zoom for so many years. Um, I'll start with, at, at REAP, we recognize the pressing challenge of climate change that's coming in the, especially in the coming years. Um, we know that the community as a whole needs to take action. So we've set a milestone, which we hope represents a much larger transformation in the community. And you can see that on your screen. By 2030, people impacted by Reap Green Solutions will have taken 10,000 meaningful actions to collectively shift our community to a resilient, low carbon future. And I'm happy to report there were over a third of the way towards our 2030 goal. Uh, these actions represent tangible steps that people have taken um, on their own sustainability journeys. In the remaining slides, we'll talk about some of those meaningful actions. Home energy evaluations are a great example of this. As you can see on the slide, 465 homeowners had a home energy evaluation uh, over the past year, taking advantage of the new Greener Homes Initiative from the federal government. And 140 of those have already completed their upgrades based on our recommendations and have received incentives to help cover the cost. These are meaningful actions that achieve greenhouse gas reductions year over year. 
We're very pleased to report significant growth in energy evaluations and completed retrofits in the city of Waterloo specifically, as compared to our previous impact report. 110 Waterloo households uh, undertook energy evaluations and 58 of those completed retrofits, which is twice as many as the previous, our previous impact report. And that, those will, all of those will result in over 25 tons of carbon reductions year over year. Um, those homeowners received over $93,000 in incentives to, to do that work and have uh, injected just about half a million into the local economy through that process. So these are, these are actions that are meaningful for the environment and the economy. We want to continue to encourage home energy retrofits. Last year, we told council that we were working on wraparound support for home energy evaluations. This year, we concluded the design of what that would look like, including loans for home energy upgrades. This is action 3.1.9 of Transform WR, which Mary Jane will speak to later in the presentation. An important outcome of that process is the report that you see on the right-hand side of the slide, which talks about equity in home energy loan programs. We've shared this report with a number of other communities with the, throughout Canada who've been asking about it because we are the first to specifically look at equity in these financing programs. Our Healthy Yards and Neighborhoods programs are an important resource to adapt to climate change. We've developed a suite of online tools that show how people have to naturalize their yards and which are the building blocks of climate resilient neighborhoods. We work with staff from the Waterloo Service Center to put in a functional and beautiful rain garden where we've hosted several hands-on workshops the last two years running. We also have full service offerings including backyard tree planting in four cities, including City Waterloo. Um, and we offer one-on-one -on -one support to do things like naturalization and rain gardens in City Kitchener and City Guelph. And our Bloom and Box fundraiser, which provides harder to find native plants that thrive in our climate. And keep an eye out for a, a tree walk that we'll be leading uh, in a natural area of Waterloo in partnership with the city to encourage greater community participation in these types of spaces. And that will be coming during Canadian Forest Week, which is the third week of September. And you're up, Mary Jane. Okay. Hi, everybody. Great to be back again. I'm going to talk a little bit about our broader outreach as entry points for environmental action. And you see here some of the participation we had in the past year. Public campaigns like the Zero Waste Challenge, um, our youth cutting carbon work with students, and many of our workshops and webinars are free and open and uh, easy entry points on someone's sustainability journey to go deeper and learn more, to have more capacity for action. And we're very grateful for our core funders helping us offer these important resources. During the pandemic, our workshops moved online and it was very interesting to see how much more participation was taking place. And it was partly because we could reach a broader audience, they were more accessible. And I think there was also a real craving for especially work having to do with green spaces. We had a lot of participation in workshops regarding tree stewardship, naturalizing yards, um, those kinds of things. So as we come out of the pandemic, we're planning to keep a mixture of both, in-person and virtual webinars, in order to make sure everybody can participate in the way that works for them. As I think most of you know, REAP co-leads Climate Action WR along with our colleagues at Sustainable Waterloo Region. Our long-term climate action strategy, Transform WR, was endorsed by Council in 2021. It is our guiding light now, and we wanted you all to have it at your fingertips, so I'm hoping by now you've all received your hard copy. Yes, excellent. I see the nods. I look at it almost every day. I'm very glad you got them. Our sector committees, you see them here on the screen, have been doing some great work this past year. And just as an example, a couple projects that they worked on were equity in the cycling trail networks in our cities, working along with staff, 
and helping to demystify heat pumps in both businesses and homes. Next step for us at Climate Action WR is to release the re-inventory report, How Do We Do in Greenhouse Gas Emissions as of 2020? And we, I think, are already setting dates to come before you to share that information with Council. Here is a breakdown of our expenses by program to give you a sense of um, the work we're doing. And I think a couple things that stand out for me are the diversity of programs that we have, making some entry points for people in different ways, depending on what you're looking for, and that we're almost equally in climate mitigation and climate adaptation um, through um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions through our energy work and also helping people adapt to the changing climate we're already living in with programs for flood prevention, pollinator species, the kinds of things that Patrick was talking about and Matthew and Tom were talking about. And then here, when we look at our revenue, Patrick and I look at this every year to see how the diversity of revenue breaks down for us too and are happy when we see contract and fee-for-service work almost equal to funding and donations and grants because that means we're achieving a healthier diversity of revenue for REAP to try to help maintain some stability going forward. Looking ahead, we want to tell you about a couple things. One is that we've put together a coalition of just, we've just brought together some of the organizations working on tree stewardship and tree planting in the region. And together we applied for funding from the Two Billion Trees program from the federal government and we're successful. So we're really pleased with that. It's going to help us start our own tree nursery and you will hear more from us as we develop that. It's at the very beginning. And the other item we wanted to mention is that we are looking deeper into the issue of energy poverty, which is a phrase that refers to when a household spends more than twice what the average Canadian spends on energy bills compared to their take-home income. And if you want to learn more right away, we have a blog on our website that you can have a look at. Uh, there's lots more to understand on this issue, and um, we're diving into it as best we can. Finally, I would like to say a big thank you to our core funders that you see here on the screen. And Mayor McCabe, you're on the board of Innova Power Corp. So we want to say thank you to you for the core funding that Innova provides for REAP. It helps make all of this possible and um, helps us bring more programs and resources to the community. Uh, a special thanks to the staff that we get to work with on environmental issues, in particular, Anna Rustic, Sandy Little, Paula Mendez, and Peggy Stevens. We really appreciate their participation and insights in our work. And we want to conclude with an open invitation to talk about sustainability and program partnership. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you very much uh, to you both. It's uh, always great to see you, Mary Jane. I, we, our, our relationship goes back quite a while. So um, I really appreciate all the work you've done for so many years. I think it's decades now in our community to, to, uh, to lead us towards a more sustainable future. So thank you both for the work you do. Council, do you have um, questions? Yes, Councilor Wright. Thank you. Through you, Mayor, um, I, I've definitely been a, a beneficiary of REAP services, and I always go and, and check out what trees you're planting as part of your tree planting program. Um, I just, on the weekend, ordered a pecan tree for my backyard to buddy up with an existing pecan tree that I have because they're both Carolinian forest species. Um, and I have a mini uh, pawpaw nursery on the go in our backyard. So if you ever need pawpaws, you know where to come. Um, my question has specifically to do with our vertical communities rather than our homeowner communities. And so I'm just wondering um, what you think the strategy or where the opportunities are with our high rise buildings and our condo developments as we intensify. Uh, this is a big theme for, for Waterloo, this intensification. And we need all of those uh, climate resiliency measures in order to do that in a way that benefits future residents. Well, it's a very good question. And I see um, 
impacts on the insides of the buildings and on the outside of the buildings that need to be looked at. And uh, it is something that we want to work on now. It pushes the boundaries of REAP's energy expertise, which is primarily single family homes, but we also have expertise in just bringing a community together, and that can be a community of renters. So we talked a little bit with um, some potential partners uh, about um, applying for funding for something with, a partner, with apartments very early on, very new. Um, I think there's a lot more to do there. And even our research in energy poverty could lead us in that direction. And I just wonder if you want to add anything about the green space, Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we know, as, as you mentioned, that our, our communities are growing and our housing stock is changing. Um, even within the existing sort of mix, we know, certainly from a stormwater perspective, that a lot of the impermeable surfaces are on sort of non-residential sort of settings as well. So it is a, it is a challenge. Um, and it is something that uh, we're looking to diversify our residential programming and work with uh, primarily, like I think our in is through multi-residential, but we realize that there's other types of properties as well. Um, and looking at churches and schools to kind of get us in a little bit of a wedge into some of the institutional industrial properties as well. Um, yeah, so so something that we're looking to try and evolve our, our programming and services as a, you know, it's a, a, a lot of the same tools, but different, highly different motivations based on, you know, what the property owners of those types of properties. Thank you. Did, did you have a follow-up? No. Uh, Councillor Vasek. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh. Uh, through you, Mayor McCabe, thanks so much for your presentation. I saw the first picture and was like, how do I get that little river on my property for our kids? So I looked, and um, it looks like the Rain Garden Coach program only exists in Guelph. So then I was sad. And then, <laughs> then it made me think to your tree program, which took quite some time to get to Waterloo. It's only recently that it's come to Waterloo as well which led me to my question, which is um, like, how, how do you come to start a program in one city and then expand it to other cities? And then how might the city, um, how does the city uh, help you with that in any way? Or are they separate programs from the municipality? So what can we do so that I can get a rain garden in my front lawn with a rain coach? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, ideally we, we like to, uh, not make a cookie cutter, but ideally something that can scale and we can take like the Guelph Rain Garden program and bring it to other. It actually started out of a, a project we did in Kitchener neighborhoods and kind of grew into that. So it's really sort of uh, about relationship building with our municipal partners and we have strong ones with Waterloo. Um, uh, there is there is work to be done. Um, or, and I know they're they're planning specifically. I know they're doing a lot of sort of strategizing around the non-res side of things. Um, so I don't have a I don't have a you know silver bullet answer for you. Uh, that's that's really how we grow our, our programs. And but we 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 do grow grow them so that they can be sort of moved from one city to the other. And ideally, like the the tree one, like you said, we're in we're all all the four major sort of municipalities in the watershed. So uh, we'd love to get there with some of our other programs. That's great. And it sounds like you have the relationships with city staff too, so that if this is something that you feel is ready to be transplanted. Thank you. <laughs> um, into Thank you. <laughs> into Waterloo, then um, you have the relationships already. And then the other th thought I just wanted to throw out is that at least in the ward, um, there are two play like parks going in in the next kind of in the next year uh, at Bridgeport and Weber or so and then after this council term at uh, Lexington and Bridge and so even just rain rain gardens in in playgrounds would be really wonderful too so that it's not just um, property owners who are able to kind of access that I mean it was such a wonderful photo to put up front because you can you really feel the em emotion of what of what that could be um, for small children and how that 
builds sort of a love of wanting to 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 save our planet for for a lifetime because of that kind of tangible kinetic experience that they've had. So so thinking beyond just the private spaces to the public spaces too. Thanks so much for your presentation. Thank you. Any other questions? Just a, just um, a couple of questions for me. Again, thank you very much for the um, for the presentation. I really appreciate, it. and I have also um, um, benefited greatly from a couple of different energy audits um, and and fuel switching that was um, activated through REAP with the home energy audits and, and, and energy evaluation. So if anyone's thinking of doing that, get your name in quick. They're they're busy. So, but they're but it's an excellent service. Um, Really interested to hear more about that tree walk in September. That sounds really interesting. Um, my question, though, is when you're talking about the energy, the poverty, the, uh, the, the sorry, the energy poverty, um, and I was curious because I know I've heard through other places I used to work, um, work that was being done with like Clean Air Partnership and REAP on the, the PACE program or the... Um, property assessed clean energy programs and i'm just wondering I, I know that you had come to waterloo years ago around that but i'm just wondering if that's something that is still being considered as a way to help encourage people to do that fuel switching or if through the energy poverty study you've done you're you're learning more about that and and if there's things that we should be thinking about here mm -hmm. i'm going to go back a few slides to answer that so this is, was our exploration of that question. Um, you're right, we came years, a few years ago. I mean, it had been too early to ask about PACE, and uh, maybe we were ahead of our time. Um, but <laughs> the, in the last few years, the federal government came out with a program called Community Energy Efficiency, and they are encouraging municipalities across Canada to provide loans for their residents to make their homes more energy efficient and offering money to study what that could look like in your own community. And we applied and got some money a couple years ago and brought together all these partners, especially the inner two circles, uh, yes, to talk about, um, to meet every month for a year to, and we hired a couple of consultants to say, what could this look like in our community? And what we landed on after a lot of consideration of having having these loans paid back on the property taxes or paid back on energy bills or using third-party financing like a credit union. Um, we landed on paying back through electricity bills. And that was just lots of good exploration of the pros and cons of different models. And a couple of the factors that led to that are that um, paying it back through the property taxes would need to be done by each individual city and township rather than at the regional level, because that's how we pay our property taxes. And that would require bylaws from each one. And it would be more onerous and not available to be done together. Um, another reason is that our electric uh, utilities have experience in energy conservation and an interest in this experience in having people repay water heaters, for example, over time on their bills. And there's a nice match between making energy improvements and paying it back on what's hopefully a lower bill when you do it. So that is the model that we came out with. The next step is to apply for funding from the federal government to implement it, and that'll be a mixture of loans to backstop those loans to homeowners and grants to set it all up. And that has to be a municipality, and the region is working on it. And they recently hired somebody who has that as his mandate, who we've been meeting with, and we hope it will go forward this year to get that application out the door and kind of further develop what it looks like. Oh, fantastic. Okay, yeah. great. Well, we'll look for some more information about that then, okay. I guess, at some point. And and I was just thinking, too, to Councillor Vasek's question about um, naturalizing or like putting rain gardens and that in some of our public places. I would mm. suspect that that's something then that you would need to work with our staff on. Mm. Um, Right. Happy Just, to yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I know you have a good relationship with some of them. So yeah, it's a great idea. And, um, and uh, yeah, I think that's something it sounds like we've got a few things going up with staff, I, like with, uh, with the previous discussion from uh, Matthew and Tom, and then as well as the work you're doing. So that's, uh, that's exciting, I think. So does anyone else have any questions? No? Great. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Councillor Rowe. 
Thank you through you, uh, Mayor. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really interesting. I was just curious, um, based on Mayor McCabe's comment that um, REAP has been um, working for some time and that you're very busy. So I'm wondering what your um, perspective is on how busy you are and if you're encouraged by uh, the community members that are looking to make these changes. Mm. Yes, very encouraged. I love that. We both did, I'm sure. This is Patrick's bailiwick at REAP as the head of Green Infrastructure Program. So we loved the presentation that we saw and um, fully support what they are calling for. And um, we are busy and happy to keep being busy and um, keep making more partnerships, finding more funding to bring to town and implement the kinds of things we, that you, we all want to do. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and I guess the, uh, the other piece to that is that it does have a significant benefit to local, um, often tradespeople and you know local contractors yes. who, who do the work after you've made the recommendations from the home energy audit. So certainly we've hired a number of local companies to upgrade our windows and our switch to a heat pump and and uh, and you know insulation and things like that. So yeah, it's great for the environment and for the economy, which I think is the shared goal. So. Any further questions? No? Okay, thank you so much. A pleasure to see you both. Um, thank you for all the work that you're doing and the continue to do in the community. So moving on, Council, we are at uh, item six, the consent agenda. There's two, item, two items in there. Um, need a motion to approve the um, 6A, the traffic and, by par traffic and parking bylaw amendments. Um, do I, or sorry, sorry we do them all at once, but <laughs> yes, do, does anyone have a, any questions about these? or? One? I would like to move the report 2023-003, Significant Festivals and Events Policy Revision, just out for a brief discussion. Okay, sure. Do I have a, do we need to, we just pull it out, do we need a seconder? Yes, okay, so moved by Councillor Wright, seconded by Councillor Rowe to move um, uh, that item out. So then we will, do, then I need a motion to, um, just to approve the traffic, the CA. Does anyone have, uh, moved by Councillor Bodley, seconded by Councillor Roach. So all in favor, that's, a, that's unanimous. So then the 6B, the Significant Festivals and Events Policy Revision. Um, Councillor Wright, you had a question? Yes, I do, thank you. Through you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to um, have a brief chat in chamber here about um, the opportunity for sustainability to be included in a future version of this policy. I'm not suggesting that we make any amendment at, right at this time. Um, but what I wanted to discuss is whether, because these are significant festivals and they're the largest events that come into our city, um, I think the city has a responsibility to help enable sustainability in uh, festival operations. And one of the ways that we could do that is to require a sustainability plan from these festivals. And I think the sustainability planning within event planning has matured enough that there are some really fantastic examples. There's also existing policy from other communities that we can look to. Um, so I just wanted to open that conversation and, and provide you a little time to, to um, respond. Through you, Mayor, to Councillor Wright. Uh, so just for clarification, these aren't the largest festivals that happen in Waterloo. These are simply the largest of our affiliate organizations that present uh, festivals in the city of Waterloo. So we are, uh, we have been working, staff have been working with the sustainability office to explore potential resources that we can offer to support uh, sustainability in these organizations. Um, I'm not sure that this particular policy is the place necessarily to include the requirement of a sustainability plan, um, although we can if that's what council directs. This particular policy is uh, really an administrative policy uh, that just allows these festivals uh, to have some blanket bylaw exemptions rather than having individual festivals come to council to make those requests every year for events that happen every year. 
Um, however, around sustainability, we agree that it is very important and we would like to develop uh, some toolkits to help these festivals. These are small volunteer run festivals. Uh, so I think we have an obligation as a municipality to develop as many supports as possible to help them down that sustainability road. But I think we also need to look at what infrastructure uh, the city can provide to support sustainability for these events. Um, and I think it would be interesting to look more broadly beyond just these events at other events that we support, so especially private sector events. Um, and perhaps work with parks and recreation on some of the other events, especially things like sporting events, to develop some standardized guidelines and benchmarks that could be used for all of the activities that we have happening in the community. And just to follow up on that, so do you see that being an integrated approach across parks, across the Arts and Culture Committee, the Sustainability Committee, et cetera? Uh, through you, Mayor, to Councillor Wright, uh, definitely. I think that needs it needs to be done as an integrated approach. Um, I think some of the resources that are needed would be um, more effective if they were scalable, uh, and we'd have a better sense of what resources we need in terms of our budget process, I think, if we approached it from that perspective. And just one last follow-up question here. So one of the things that is in this policy includes the... Um, it's around the fireworks um, uh, licensing and uh, the fee exemption on that. And so I'm just wondering where that discussion is on the city side, just because we do we have seen other cities move on this very recently. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, through you, Mayor, uh, to the Councillor. Uh, as permitted through the Waterloo bylaws, fireworks are currently allowed, so this allows those uh, organizations who do wish to have fireworks shows just step over that bylaw exemption um, through this policy. Um, it is not as frequent. Um, we haven't had a fireworks show with these festivals in many years. Uh, most uh, festivals and events are moving away from them, but still, as it is a bylaw, we wanted to make that exemption available. Thank you for that context. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Sounds like there's some by more bylaws to review or policies to review. Um, other questions from anyone? Just a quick question for me. One of the things that when I read through the report, and again, thank you for this, um, um, was just the the BIA wasn't uh, mentioned in this, and are they not considered one of the affiliated partners that would fall under this category for the the exemptions? So I just I just I don't know. I yeah, I'm just looking for clarity around that because it felt like they were missing, quote unquote. So the BIA is not an affiliated organization. Affiliation is really a service agreement uh, that the city has with community organizations to provide a specific service or event. Um, so BIA wouldn't fall under this. This The events included in this also happen annually uh, on an ongoing basis. The BIA does run a number of events, but not necessarily the same event every year. So this policy does not prevent the BIA from coming forward in the event that they needed a bylaw exemption. Most of the events run by the BIA don't require bylaw exemptions, um, and we do provide other support to the BIA through uh, equipment loans and free use of public square and that sort of thing. So if they they need to come on an, um, on an event by event basis? If, if they were running an event that required a bylaw exemption, yes. Okay, okay, thank you, that's helpful. All right. Um, any no, seeing no other questions, then um, I need a motion to approve this um, this um, motion to approve this report. Councillor Wright, um, seconded by Councillor Vasek. All in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you both for uh, for um, attending. Moving on to staff reports. My Main Street program summary. Um, this is um, a report. The, the recommendation is that council receive the report for information, but council wondering if people have, if anyone has any questions. Sorry, do you have a, you have a presentation? Sorry, okay. So welcome, uh, Laura and Alicia. Um, we will turn the mic, or turn, the, turn it over to you.
Munz, and this is my colleague Alicia Vestard. We were both hired by the city as ambassadors to run the My Main Street program and are here to share a program summary with you here today. So, an overview of the program. It was funded by the Federal Economic Development Agency and administered by Economic Developers Councilor, Council of Ontario. It supported 63 Main Street communities across Southern Ontario. The city received funding of $115,000, including $100,000 towards the salary of two Main Street ambassadors, Alicia and myself, as well as $15,000 in marketing and administration support. The city's application was put forth in collaboration with the Waterloo Region Small Business Centre and Uptown Waterloo BIA, and the program focused on offering supports to small independent businesses, prioritizing equity-deserving groups. So the program ran from March 2022 and is just wrapping up now in March 2023. So we just wanted to show the areas of focus throughout the program. The city supported businesses in two districts, Uptown Waterloo and the University District that you can see there on the maps. Uh, my personal area of focus was Uptown Waterloo and Alicia supported the University District, although we did work together and collaborate throughout the program. These two areas were selected based on the high density clusters of small independent businesses within them that met the program's eligibility requirements. So, some of the small business supports provided throughout the program included customized local market research reports that were produced by Enveronics that included demographics within a 15 minute walk radius uh, from those businesses that we were working with, access to online and in-person training workshops, referrals to organizations including the City of Waterloo, Region of Waterloo Small Business Centre and Uptown Waterloo BIA. We made recommendations of other grant programs, training and supports outside of My Main Street and those host organizations. And there were 10 $10,000 non-repayable contributions for each Main Street district. So there were 20 $10,000 grants in total. So the program was very successful. It saw 20 small businesses in Waterloo receive $10,000 in funding each. We were able to connect businesses to local support systems. Stronger relationships were fostered between the city and those two districts in Uptown Waterloo and University and those business owners. There were over 160 businesses served with a total of 400 visits. Malisha and I facilitated three in-person small business workshops, as well as conducted a photo blitz of 40 small businesses, so 20 in each district. And we also produced a small business ad campaign for Grand Magazine. So we just wanted to show you the successful grant recipients. You'll see the 10 businesses listed under Uptown Waterloo, as well as the 10 for University District. Uh, we received a lot of feedback working closely with these business owners throughout the application process. They were, they were excited for a city position that solely focused on supporting the small business community through direct outreach. They really appreciated the eligible funding categories that they were broad and unlike any other grant, that they were able to make large investments in their business that would support their growth strategy. So a few purchase examples that businesses made included new furniture, kitchen equipment, store, or store signage, and new inventory uh, product lines. And multiple business owners mentioned that they had been sitting on these purchase ideas for years and that this funding helped them get back on track after loss of revenue during pandemic lockdowns. We facilitated a small business photo blitz. So we were able to photograph 40 small businesses within our two districts. Those businesses received professional photographs for their own par personal marketing use and photo permissions were received that will allow future use by the city, Uptown Waterloo, and, or BIA, and the Small Business Center. So a business, a small business ad campaign is set for Grand Magazine Spring Edition that's being released in May that will see a circulation of 20,000 copies. So on this slide, we have an example of one of our ads that will be featured in Grand Magazine. It's a single page ad showcasing 27 business owners in front of their storefronts. 
And in addition to the single page ad seen here, there will be a two page advertorial featuring five successful grant recipients, as well as a one third page ad highlighting uh, retail. So three ads in total. We also designed and hosted three small business workshops. The topics and speakers were selected based on feedback and uh, sorry, feedback that we received from small business owners throughout the program. So those workshops offered a learning and networking opportunity on the following topics, finding more ideal customers, getting Google working for you, and collaboration over competition. And lastly, our recommendation is that Council receives this report for further information. And if you have any questions, we are happy to take those now. Thank you very much to you both. Um, so, Council, questions about this? Yes. Councillor Wright. Thank you. Through you, Mayor. I'm, I'm so excited. This is Board 7 stuff, so I'm, I'm, I'm super into it. Um, first question is whether, and I'm going to ask both my questions and then I'll ask you to respond, but first question is whether um, you'll be leveraging the um, profiles in Grand Magazine on Instagram, because I want to promote those too. Um, and secondly, um, is the what now question. Um, I'm assuming that this was a one-time grant and um, I'd love to hear more about what the, how, how the businesses perceive that support and whether there's interest in, in you know, finding legs for this going forward. Thanks. Uh, I can start with, actually, do you know what? I'm gonna defer the what now to Kristen first. So if you wanna handle that question. Thank you, through you, Mayor, to Councillor. Um, so the what now would be, um, we are waiting around two announcements. So applications have been made through the Main Street Program in partnership with Urban uh, Land Institute and um, Economic Development Council of Ontario. So I'm not sure what that'll look like. I'm not sure it'll look exactly the same. I know that it'll be scaled back funding. So the amount of money available to businesses uh, is likely to be less. Um, so we are waiting that to see if there'll be an opportunity for us to get on board. Um, we do run somewhat similar programs through the Small Business Centre in terms of workshops and that type of thing, but we really do rely on programs like this to be able to offer grants specifically to businesses. Okay, and if you don't have any follow-up questions, did you have a follow-up question for Kristen before oh. I answer the... Yeah, you can go the, ahead. Oh, so yeah, as far as the marketing campaign, we worked closely uh, with Shirley Liu and Communications at the city. And so the city does have access, as I mentioned, to all of those beautiful photos and will be able to produce other uh, upcoming campaigns. And with this one, I think that the plan is to be able to uh, share that. I'm not sure yet on social media, but... Um, hopefully, it will be granted access to whoever wants to be able to use that for campaigns as well. Yeah. Thank you all for those answers. Did you have a, anything else, Councillor Wright? No. Council, any other questions? No, seeing none. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for your work over the past year. I know in in the since uh, December and then a couple times in January, I've done walkthroughs with Tracy from the BIA, primarily in the uptown area, and uh, and a number of the the small business owners that I met with and raised that program and appreciated the support that they had received through that. So thanks to you both and through you to Kristen um, for the for the work that you did on that. I think it's been really valuable and and uh, thank you for the report today. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, yeah. So, Councillor, we need a uh, mover and a seconder, Councillor uh, Rowe to approve the report and Councillor Wright to second it. All in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. So the next staff report and uh, presentation will be the affordable housing strategy and welcome to Michelle Lee um, who will be presenting this and just a quick note. Um, there's a small error that was noticed belatedly. So if you're at, if you go to recommendation number four, it says it references table three. That actually should be table two. And um, for people um, checking that later, that will be updated on our on our website um, as soon as possible. So um, over to you, Michelle. Thank you again for attending today and the work that you put into this report. We're looking forward to it. Thank you, Mayor McCabe and Council. 
My name is Michelle Lee, and I'm a policy planner at the city. And I'm just going to spend a few minutes to present the key highlights of the strategy. We can't cover the whole thing, uh, obviously, but I just wanted to draw your attention to some of the context behind it and the big picture items uh, that the strategy represents. I know Council is well aware that housing uh, costs have been increasing dramatically across Canada, and that includes in Waterloo. Um, the impacts of these rising costs have been felt most acutely by uh, low-income households, but increasingly uh, by moderate-income households as well. We've had uh, or in, enacted a number of initiatives over the course of the past 10 years to help address housing affordability issues. Uh, so this is in advance of the strategy. Some of the things that we've uh, carried out over the past 10 years include things like grants for affordable housing, the creation of affordable housing grant program, which is soon to launch, property tax exemptions for not-for-profit affordable housing developments, heightened density bonusing, uh, for which we've used the funds to help uh, create affordable housing. Uh, so these initiatives uh, overall in the past 10 years have amounted to over $800,000 worth of uh, grant money used to offset the costs of deferred or um, uh, waived development charges. So that's what we've been doing in the last 10 years. But we uh, know, uh, and Council also directed staff in recognition of this, uh, we know that we need a coordinated and, and more strategic approach to address affordable housing, particularly given the magnitude of the problem. The affordable housing strategy that we have today uh, is focused on what the city can do to uh, help address the problem. Uh, it focuses on the housing system as a whole, and its emphasis is on uh, low and moderate income households. Uh, we've taken the approach that uh, we want to focus on the main drivers of uh, affordability or lack of affordability uh, that fall within municipal control. And the idea of this is that we don't want to duplicate the actions of other levels of government or the private sector or the, or the not-for-profit sector. We want to complement those actions that are already uh, important and, and uh uh, helping the system. You can see here that the uh, the scope of the strategy is uh, covering all of the uh, housing spectrum from emergency shelters all the way up to market rental and ownership housing. Um, we recognize that the housing system works as an integrated whole. It, it, improvements to one area or one aspect of that system can actually help improve the circumstances for those that are below or above uh, that particular spot on the chain. And so uh, we tackle the affordable housing issue at a variety of different angles for this reason. We also recognize that the region of Waterloo is the um, designated service manager for housing for our region. Uh, and they are obliged to develop a housing and homelessness plan for the city, and actually for this, the region as a whole. So the affordable housing strategy is intended to complement that plan as opposed to replace it or to, uh, to uh, step in and take control over elements that are already uh, happening by the region. So just uh, to step back a little bit further, um, all levels of government uh, do have a responsibility for housing supply and affordable housing specifically as do the private sector and not-for-profit sector. We all are working together on this. Um, one of the things that senior levels of government have that the municipality doesn't have is access to uh, deep financial capabilities. Uh, senior levels of government can provide the, the depth of funding required to construct new housing, to construct non-market housing, and to provide programs for those who are facing homelessness. The City of Waterloo has a unique role, though, to play that the other levels of government don't have, and that is that we are really the enablers and facilitators of development. So we actually adopt the policies and regulations that enable where new housing can go, where, uh, or what size of that housing is, uh, where the, what kind of density that housing uh, is going to have. Um, we approve development permits, and the speed at which we can approve those permits has an impact on housing supply. We can um, reduce uh, or adjust our charges and fees to encourage the types of housing that we'd like to see. 
we can offer grants within our more limited financial capabilities, and we can collaborate and partner with uh, people in the public and private sector. So using provincial targets and uh, the housing pledge that you're going to hear about in the next uh, item on today's agenda, we've calculated that we're going to need about 15,232 units by 2033. Within that broader target, we are uh, anticipating that we're going to need 30% of those units to be affordable to low and moderate income households and that about 39% of those new units should be affordable given the high proportion of renters that we have in our community. Within that affordable housing target, we've broken it down into non-market and market units. We estimate we'll need about 1,219 non-market units to support those who are at the lowest end of the income spectrum. Uh, these are typically subsidized units that you might see constructed by a not-for-profit organization or by the region of Waterloo. Um, but in addition to that, we'll need about 3,350 market units. These might be things like uh, rental units that uh, offer multiple uh, multiple bedrooms, but by different households, so like a larger rental unit or a basement apartment that would be at the low end of market value. To achieve those targets, we've identified 81 actions. 59 of those actions we think we can incorporate into our current work plans, um, either immediately or over the course of the next 10 years. 22 of the actions we've recognized require additional staff and or funding uh, to implement. And we've asked council to direct us to start initiating those first 59 that we know that we can incorporate into our existing work plans and to begin the planning process and consideration for the remaining 22 as part of the 2024 to 2026 budgeting process. Um, We've also highlighted the need uh, or the desire for additional planning support as a, in terms of a policy planner in the recommendations to highlight the fact that we don't currently have a policy planner responsible for the implementation of this plan. And so uh, while we can incorporate it into our current workloads, that work will be carried out by many different individuals uh, without uh, the benefit of a coordinated uh, individual or coordinating individual to oversee the whole project. Um, in addition to that, uh, we have learned that CMHC has just announced uh, a funding program that could have a real potential benefit for us in achieving some of these actions, both the ones that have been identified as being part of our uh, existing workload and also those that we know we need additional funding for. So we will be looking into that and taking full advantage of that as we can. So that's it for me and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Michelle. That's um, very helpful. And um, so we'll look to council to see if they have any questions and uh, we'll start with Councillor Rowe. Through you, Mayor McCabe. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was, it's such a comprehensive report and it's so much information. Thank you so much. Um, I'm actually was looking at part of the report that talks about alternate alternative ideas in terms of multi-tenant housing, home sharing, co-ownership models. And I'm just wondering if you can expand on how the city would, would support those kinds of initiatives. Through you, Mayor McCabe. Um, we've had a number of conversations with the various uh, proponents, or you could call them um, individuals that are part of those types of organizations. So the types of supports we could provide kind of vary with respect to what the program might be. Um, sometimes the supports would be things like getting out of the way uh, and enabling them to do the good work that they would like to do without creating additional process for them. So anticipating their needs and trying to create a, a policy framework that supports them. Um, so an example of this is the pilot project that we've proposed for the home share program whereby um, we would um, cover the cost of the rental licensing fee for the first 10 uh, units that would go through this home share program because we recognize that that might be a barrier to them getting off the ground. And then we can reevaluate after that first year to see if it was successful and, uh, and how it worked. 
Um, another example of how we can collaborate or, or enhance the work of those innovative programs is um, looking at how we might encourage uh, some of those, uh, I forget what they're called, they're, uh, they're home ownership programs that allow you to leverage and share the cost of ownership with an investor. Um, and uh, we're looking into ways to consider that program as part of the inclusionary zoning work that we're doing, and also uh, looking to see if there are any barriers to uh, implementing that program even without our involvement through inclusionary zoning. So those are two examples of how we could um, help facilitate that work. Thank you. And are there any examples of this work being done now? Like, if not in the city of Waterloo, are there other cities you know of that um, are adopting some of these measures? Yes. Um, I mean, I think it would be fair to say that every municipality in Ontario right now, particularly southern Ontario, is looking at all of the tools they have available to them to try to um, help all the players within the housing system um, bring forward more affordable housing and more housing opportunities. Um, so uh, some examples include um, like going back to that program where there is um, equity sharing with respect to home ownership. Um, some municipalities have offered uh, uh, educational sort of opportunities for people to learn more about them and they've helped facilitate that as one of their uh, ways of uh, spreading the word um, other municipalities have looked at um, unique um, modular housing uh, opportunities and, and ways to enable quick builds and making sure that their uh, zoning bylaws aren't interfering with um, the, the provision of very affordable modular housing uh, where it's needed. So yes, there are lots of examples to, to look at. Toronto, Hamilton, Ottawa are some uh, examples of municipalities that are moving forward on a lot of those ideas. Thank you. That's great. I just have one more question, if I may. Um, I just wanted to uh, just have you quickly uh, maybe expand a little bit on the website in terms of um, supports for people who may be evicted um, due to renovations, etc., and what that would look like. Sure. Through you, Mayor McCabe. Um, there are at, there's at least one program in the community that's offered by a not-for-profit organization. There may be others as well uh, that provide support to tenants that are either facing eviction or precariously housed and may soon face eviction uh, for a variety of reasons. And the types of supports that this uh, that can be provided to such tenants include things like support with the English language and navigating. Uh, the rules of the, the perhaps the townhouse they live in or the apartment they live in, uh, providing uh, process support to understand the, the forms and requirements of the landlord and tenant tribunal, uh, helping them interpret the forms that they do receive when they receive an eviction notice or some other um, demand from for them. Um, so these types of supports are provided by uh, peers that usually have lived experience themselves who work immediately with the, the tenant who is in need um, and helping them navigate the system with the ultimate goal of trying to keep them in the housing and resolve the conflict because there is an understanding that if should they lose that housing, they would be uh, possibly homeless and would have a very difficult time finding new housing. So um, these programs rely on grant funding uh, to operate. Uh, a lot of them uh, can rely on community foundation funding for a certain period of time, but their funding is a little bit precarious. And so what is recommended in the action item in this affordable housing strategy is to look at a, a fairly modest but meaningful to them um, financial support to allow them to keep going for a period of three years, particularly when we're in this housing crunch where uh, tenants can get easily evicted if, if they're uh, not able to navigate the system. Excellent. And just one last question then. And is this something um, then if this city has a website page dedicated to support that those types of um, supports could be listed there if someone needed that information? Yes, uh, through you, Mayor McCabe. Uh, as part of, so all the, the actions are slightly integrated. So as part of another action that talks about providing 
uh, supports to tenants through an online sort of uh, support website. Um, we can build on the, the website that we already have in place, but we could also connect people to this service very easily through a link, through a phone number, a name, and, and keep that up to date uh, so that tenants have a, a place to go. That would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Rowe. Um, Councillor Vasek, go ahead. Uh, thanks through you, Mayor um, Cabe. Um, so I think, great report. Um, and I think reading the report and hearing you respond to just a few questions already um, and the work that I've been able to do with you over the last number of years and ask you specific questions on this last council term, I think shows what a benefit it is to have a dedicated staff person working on affordable housing. Uh, especially someone who's knowledgeable uh, and capable, which you clearly have shown yourself to be. So I, I'm, I have some concern about what it sounds like will be until uh, we have another staff person, um, should we approve that? It sounds like that would be something that would come forward to council um, in a budget time, perhaps. Uh, I have some concerns that this might be something that people are kind of working off the side of their desk doing in addition to their their main jobs. So I guess I'm curious to hear from you what you think the risks might be of um, not having a dedicated staff person to this and and uh, why, why that's really needed for these 22 actions or, or can we simply have people uh, tag, tag it on to their jobs? Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, do you want to take this out on? Okay. Certainly a great question. Um, for me, it's really around the, the pace of movement or, or implementation. And so uh, Michelle has done a great job on, on this file and, and would continue to, to work on it. I just want to re remind council that she's also our heritage planner. And so it's really just kind of getting back to the pace of implementation. That's really the, the key risk. Um, and then obviously there are some items that are outside of the scope of, of our capabilities today. But, uh, you know, per, particularly within um, the housing crunch that we're, that we're seeing now and in now, uh, we thought that it made sense to bring forward kind of the, the resource conversation. Um, it would go through the budget committee and council would, would see more uh, in the coming years. But just to highlight again, it really is around, you know, when you're working off the, the phrase is off the side of your desk. Do you have the horsepower to, to bring all of those uh, items forward in a way that satisfies council's expectations? Uh, great, thank you for that. Um, and then I, I have a question. I, I didn't quite see it explicitly in there, um, but maybe it's kind of a part of multiple different um, actions around public education and attending to any neighborhood concerns there might be and helping. How, how can we best shift mindsets around concerns with um, growth and intensification? Through you, Mayor. Um, I think that's a good point. It doesn't come out very strongly in the affordable housing strategy, but there's definitely uh, an area that uh, that we could bring in as part of some of the actions. The actions are deliberately written to be fairly general so that we can uh, tweak them as we start to explore them. And uh, one of the actions in particular uh, regarding um, developing supports and guidelines for those who are interested in infill and second units and coach houses could definitely benefit from um, a complementary uh, set of guidelines or information for those who are experiencing infill in their community, but they may not be instigating it. Um, so I think that those are tied and it's definitely something we could uh, bring in as part of that uh, guideline sort of document slash website piece that we're contemplating as part of the strategy. Okay, perfect. That's really good to um, hear. And um, about, yeah, so is there a threshold in terms of heightened density beyond which housing development no longer provides the benefits of missing middle housing, other than, of course, providing more supply? Uh, through you, Mayor, um, I think that, uh, that generally we've, uh, taken the same approach that Toronto has taken in terms of defining missing middle. So we're talking, you know, 
six, seven, eight stories at the most uh, as being Missy Middle. I think the general thrust of Missy Middle is that you have um, access to the ground um, through some amenity space of some kind, and that gets harder and harder the, the higher up you go. Um, in addition to that, it um, is a, a built form that many people desire that is uh, quite different from a higher rise built form. Um, so uh, I think it would be fair to say that when we talk about missing middle in the affordable housing strategy, we're generally talking about something that's six, maybe up to eight. Uh, I, I think the province has been starting to to say nine is messy middle. Um, but we also recognize that there are very a lot lower density messy middle types. So kind of also depends on the community or the neighborhood that you're working with and what the desired objective is. If it's, is it gentle intensification, family oriented developments that have a, at least a small patch of land, or is it um, something a little bit denser where you have tenants who maybe do not want as much access to, to the ground. So um, so it is a range definitely from two to six to nine stories. Okay, that's interesting. It makes me think like when we see then um, proposals for, for towers, then we should kind of be like getting out of our head that it might address um, affordability in any way other than supply and housing. Like, because your response makes me think that then sort of nine and below, perhaps nine, eight and below, um, is really where you get, I think I said this phrase before, I don't usually use this phrase, but uh, the biggest bang for your buck. Um, would that be right or wrong? I guess I'm just trying to understand that if a, if a tall tower came as a proposal, um, should I be wondering, could they, like even wasting my time asking, can you put affordable units in here? Or is this going to contribute to affordability in any way? Or should we really be um, turning our minds to, to these eight and nine stories for affordability? Through you, Mayor. Um, that's a good question. We've definitely heard from the development community that uh, concrete construction, which is required to build high rises, is the most expensive form of construction. And it's very difficult to build a unit that is affordable for somebody without um, laying that cost onto the others within that building. Um, however, uh, there are, I don't think that there's a, an exact yes or no. Uh, we, we think there's an opportunity through inclusionary zoning to require a certain proportion of affordable units and, and through that uh, separate um, program, we'll be coming forward to council shortly with an explanation of how we think that the costs will, will, be, will work out. But I think you, on, you are onto something in that is that it is easier for developers and builders to build things that are affordable uh, when you're talking about um, a wood frame construction. Um, so, if, for example, it's not a coincidence that most affordable housing providers uh, build six stories and under. Uh, there's a complexity and a cost that comes with the higher developments. Um, but I think you also made a good point that affordability is both, you know, direct laser focused, you know, provision of affordable units, but it's also about increasing supply. So we're trying to tackle it at both angles. And um, we definitely think that providing for missing middle housing is one of those angles that's going to give us more supply and potentially more affordable housing, but probably not in all cases. Okay, that's really helpful. Thanks. And one more question. Um, I noticed that the uh, use of city-owned lands is a, in the midterm timeline, and I forget what that is. Short term was one to three, and then I think midterm was four to six. So curious if um, the city-owned lands uh, action using city-owned lands could be initiated more quickly than the, the midterm. Through you, Mayor, I think I'm going to defer to Justin. Uh, to speak to that since uh, his team would lead that action. All right, thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor, to, to the Councillor. Um, so I think the way we've interpreted that action is that um, the four to six years is when you would see the physical 
implementation of constructed buildings. And so a lot of those actions that are kind of referenced in that item, uh, we, we feel we're working on those today as we look at um, individual opportunities to sell land and kind of our overall strategy as we're engaging with developers, uh, trying to encourage affordable housing and extract as many affordable housing opportunities out of those uh, opportunities as we as we work through them. So, so the four to six years is when I think you'll see actual developments with affordable housing from the work that we're doing. Okay, and when you say see the the development, do you mean you think there will be something completed in the midterm? That's right. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Are you, you, thanks, Councillor Vasek. Um, Councillor Bodley. Uh, thank you, through Mayor McCabe. I have a few questions here. Um, so on the missing middle piece, uh, really encouraged to see uh, the as of right uh, second and third units in semis, duplexes, triplexes in more areas is really exciting. More stacked towns in uh, more areas is also really exciting. And then the, the concept of more corridors with six stories, that, that's that's all really great stuff um, and helping push us in the right direction in my, from my perspective when it comes to missing middle housing. But I, I, I did want to ask the question, um, within the province's housing affordability task force, um, and sort of notwithstanding the fact that, as, as AMO has suggested, the, the creation of that task force had some flaws notably that there was a lack of municipal rep representation on that uh, task force um, and a lack of recognition of the role that other levels of government play when it comes to that. Um, and it focuses entirely on the municipal slash private developer role. So I just wanted to preface it, preface that. But that said, there's a bunch of really good stuff in there. There were 55 actions when it comes to the supply side in the housing affordability task force. And I guess even though the province uh, themselves can't seem to agree on which of these actions they are fully su supporting, I am curious about the one related to limiting exclusionary zoning entirely and talking about allowing as of right residential housing up to four units and up to four stories on a single residential lot. And I'd like to get some feedback from staff about whether that was considered uh, more broadly, whether that can be considered as part of our official plan uh, going forward, and maybe some discussion about why that wasn't the direction that's being proposed uh, in, the, in the strategy today. Thanks through you, Mayor McCabe. Um, we did, uh, we definitely have examined and we're uh, quite uh, up on our study of the province's um, various initiatives, including the task force uh, recommendations. So as part of this affordable housing strategy, we did look at uh, the possibility of a blanket uh, for four stories height, four units per property approach. Um, there were some concerns there, at the local level, uh, there are a lot of various contextual specific situations where that type of blanket approach might not be appropriate. Um, one of the challenges, for example, is uh, the idea of accommodating four-story buildings that requires perhaps sufficient parking out in, in a, a low-density neighborhood that's not close to transit. Um, and how are we going to maintain the various other city objectives like sufficient landscaped open space to accommodate trees and that kind of thing when you can't really develop underground parking with a four-story walk-up. So you're really going to have a very large surface parking type of situation. So we actually opted to adopt a, a fairly strategic, um, specific um, approach that our goal is to get to the same outcome of supply, but give us flexibility to have three units on a property rather than four under certain circumstances. And so that's why we've tried to focus some of the greater heights in areas that are better supported by transit or community facilities, and then uh, have uh, provided a softer, more gentle intensification approach for areas that maybe aren't as able at this time to support the four stories and uh, four units per property. That's great. Thank you for that. That's really helpful uh, feedback. Uh, second question uh, through you, Mayor McCabe, is around uh, 1.4, which uh, speaks to the parking requirements um, in developments. And so 
again, really great sort of um, uh, movement on, on this, looking into lower rates in major transit station areas, um, lower rates if the sec for secondary units or, or eliminating rates in secondary units if they're close enough to an ion station. And I was also really intrigued by the, the conversation around maximum levels of parking in certain developments. So um, again, happy to see that we're moving in in that direction here um but i'm going to question and ask whether or not we're going far enough and and get some feedback from you on this as well too particularly that we're seeing noting that we're seeing more and more municipalities uh in north america eliminating parking minimums entirely uh in in particular we know that the city of edmonton did this in 2020 i believe and I know when, when you're talking about big, um, you know, shifts in policy that it can take many years to see what the, what the impacts are, but I'm wondering if there's any feedback that we, we have or anything we've seen from the city of Edmonton's rollout that is helpful to, to sort of discuss whether or not we should be considering that more aggressive approach when it comes to parking minimums. Um, and again, just broadly, whether that was something that was considered uh, by, by staff um, as part of this report and, and maybe why or why not that didn't, uh, didn't make it in. Through you, Mayor. Um, we are actually undertaking uh, a separate parking study right now as we speak. And so the actions in the strategy, um, they flag a couple really easy uh, low-hanging fruit, you know, the, the no parking for second units within 400 meters of an ion stop. That, I mean, council could approve that today. We're off to the races. We can make those changes. Um, some of the other actions and considerations we are exploring through this separate study. Um, and uh, there's an opportunity uh, through this affordable housing strategy to sort of uh, combine the objectives and the, the initial sort of flags that we've raised through the affordable housing strategy to combine that with our assessment through this more fulsome look at parking that is happening parallel. So um, I think what I would say to your question is that we, we've we identified some quick wins, but we recognize we don't really have all the answers yet, and we will be coming back to council uh, with an official plan amendment and a zoning bylaw amendment with respect to our parking as part of the um, the process that we are going through with respect to the official plan update and review. And so you will see um, some more specific actions through that process. Uh, and this is really flagging some of, some of that process, but on also um, some easy wins that we can do today. Excellent. Thank you. Can I keep going? Okay. Yeah, unless, can, yeah I, unless council, uh, yep, that's okay. Okay, sorry. Just a couple more. So uh, through you, Mary McCabe. Uh, uh, item goal 3.1 was really interesting to me, and uh, I'd, I'd like you to maybe elaborate a little bit on it because it, it's, it talks about one of the ideas in there is talking about only allowing condo conversions if the citywide vacancy rate is above 3%. And um, to me, it seems very well intentioned, but I'm, I'm wondering if we've thought about some of the unintended consequences potentially there, uh, i.e. Would it, would it discourage purpose-built rental because it's locking developers into a built form that they then might struggle to change in the future? And are we concerned that, that maybe if there is that 3% um, vacancy rate in, in the two-year window, um, that, that we might all of a sudden lose a whole bunch of rental stock as developers see this uh, uh, all of a sudden as a big opportunity or, or their only chance to do this. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just curious if you could provide some feedback on that and, and whether other municipalities have, have, have done this and, and whether those unintended consequences have maybe been contemplated. Through you, Mayor. Um, we have followed the region of Waterloo's uh, footsteps on this. They have adopted a regional official plan that implemented this specific policy. It's uh, in front of the province right now for review. And so um, we did rely largely on the research and um, outreach that they did to gather information in the development of that policy. Um, I know that they were looking at Hamilton and City of Toronto specifically uh, as models. Uh, also, a lot of other municipalities in the GTA, Brampton, Mississauga, um, have similar approaches uh, either that they've explored or have brought forward through their official plans. Um, so uh, it is definitely something that other municipalities are uh, moving towards as they try and find ways to manage the, the loss of uh, rental housing that some people call naturally affordable. Um, we also did our own analysis of the City of Waterloo's current condo conversion policies that we have uh, in place right now. 
And uh, we found that over the last 10 years, not a single one was declined um, because the the bar was so low. I, nobody ever met the tests that were required for them uh, to, 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 or that would prevent them from converting a rental apartment to condo. Um, and so with this particular approach, it takes that original framework and it just does a slight tweak uh, in terms of time frame. Our former policy had a three-year window where uh, you would look to the previous three years to see if the vacancy rate was below 3%. This one now looks at the previous two years. Um, so we felt that it was still in line with the policy we already had in place, but was offering a nuanced, slightly more uh, stringent approach. And it didn't prevent um, uh, condo, or sorry, it didn't prevent rental operators from converting to condo provided that there was sufficient supply of rental housing in the market. So every, you know, every year that goes by, there's a, a good possibility that the vacancy rates could jump above the 3% uh, window. And then at that point, uh, a rental building could convert to condo in that case. So we were trying to find a, a balanced approach there where there was still opportunity when the market uh, sort of supports it, but that we still have a um, protection of our rental units when there is a really low vacancy of rental in the in the market. That's super interesting and, and helpful. Thank you for that added context. Um, again, uh, my next question is around um, uh, 3.2, which was supporting the transition of rental to community ownership. And again, I thought that was super interesting. And I was just hoping you could uh, <coughs> elaborate on this a little bit for me just to explain what that might look like in practice. Is is the city going to act as an intermediary for community land trusts when, when they're interested? Are we going to sort of proactively seek out uh, opportunities to purchase rental buildings and, and coordinate with land trusts and or the region on, on this? What, what does it look like in practice? Through you, Mayor. Uh, we have a number of not-for-profit uh, organizations in our community that are interested in pursuing this model of purchasing existing units and then holding them in community ownership and ensuring that they continue to be available as affordable units in perpetuity. Um, this action is intended to uh, signal to staff that we can start working with them to find out what do they need from us to help them um, in achieving their goals. Uh, obviously, we have to work within limits. Uh, we have limited financial capabilities, so we can't, you know, purchase those units for them outright. We can't necessarily act as realtors to uh, flag properties for them. But what we can do um, uh, uh, is we can explore our grant program that we have uh, developed and is going to be launched soon to see if there's an opportunity opportunity to expand that program to enable. Um, the purchase of existing rental units. Um, other things that we consider uh, is the opportunity for a loan program that allows them to access capital in the short term while they await CMHC's slower process of financing. Um, there's been discussion from the not-for-profit uh, rental community where they're, they're seeking a little bit of relief in terms of uh, property tax uh, rates. So these are things that can continue to be explored. Any particular action would still need to go through, um, if it has budgetary impacts, it would need to go through our finance team. But it's um, it would be a supporting role to enable um, these community land trusts and other not-for-profits to achieve their objectives in, in any way we can that is reasonable when it, within our financial abilities. Thank you, Councillor Bodley. Um, Councillor Wright. Thank you. Through you, Mayor. Um, this is a fantastically detailed report. I really appreciated um, that level of detail and analysis. Um, I have just some curiosities. Um, some of them are about the macro conditions, um, which you probably have some research background to, to maybe answer, and some of them are more um, granular. Um, related to what Councillor Bodley was talking about in Goal 3, optimizing existing housing, um, he brought up the 3% vacancy rate. And I'm curious about whether our overall targets are 
towards some kind of surplus and what that magic number might be, knowing that there's so many variables that go into this. Um, you know, are we looking at having any kind of, are we just meeting uh, population targets or are we aiming for actual surplus? Through you, Mayor. Uh, the, so the overall housing target that says 15,232, I think, um, is based on two primary factors. One is just the growth forecast for our community that's given to us by the province. It goes into the region's sort of hopper and they uh, distribute to each of the area municipalities the amount that we're expected to grow by. And then we need to plan accordingly. But the provincial housing pledge that you'll hear about shortly is actually an acceleration of that forecast. So the province is saying, recognizing that we have a shortage of housing or we have a housing issue, um, we want you to achieve more faster. So we want to front load that growth uh, right up uh, in the first 10 years or nine years uh, which are left. So to answer your question, um, the target that we've set is my understanding to be meeting the forecast plus trying to fill the, the gaps that we had leading into this housing crisis. So it should hopefully create a healthy surplus uh, that creates you know, some vacancy eventually uh, over the next 10 years. Okay, so just that's helpful context. I mean, my, my concern in all of this is that um, there are climate equity issues associated with housing and shelter, and it's often the people who have the least means to undertake any kind of climate mitigation measures like energy efficiency who, you know, don't have that provided to them through adequate housing. When we don't have enough swing housing to actually conduct deep retrofits of affordable housing, we run into a real crunch. So that's sort of my, my perspective coming into this, whether we're actually going to meet that kind of deep equity-based need within our community. And then the second question that I have has to do with, um, you know, in, in Uptown, we have a number of uh, houses that have been zoned uh, multi-use. So they might have an apartment on the second floor, but are also partially commercial. Um, there, that's not a, a large source of, of housing stock, but the other thing that I hear from constituents in Ward 7 is, um, you know, they see houses getting boarded up for development and then they sit empty for a long time sometimes. Um, and so the, I, I just get this constant question about whether there's any way for us in a sort of affordable housing emergency context whether it's possible to either initiate some sort of temporary amendment to zoning so that things can be converted to full residential use or not, how much flexibility there is in, in that mixed use uh, zoning. Through you, Mayor, I, I think I can respond to our long-term plan, but I might defer to Adam uh, with respect to you know emergency measures and temporary uh, bylaws and that kind of thing. Um, but we definitely recognize that um, opening things up is a key part of uh, achieving the targets in the strategy. Um, mixed use is a huge part of the official plan review, identifying more areas for mixed use, more uh, opportunities for uh, efficient use of housing or adaptive reuse or uh, encouraging uh, underutilized sites to enable housing. Um, so that is definitely a significant part of the current official plan review. I, I really couldn't say about um, using emergency measures in the bylaw to enable things in the short term. Uh, and I, I might add that we are hoping to bring forward some uh, policies to Council for consideration this year, uh, and they are going to be containing some housing policies. So, you know, we, maybe... We, Maybe that's a non-issue because those policies are coming forward as quickly as we probably could amend uh, a zoning bylaw to allow for emergency uses. But I'll just I'll just give it over to Adam to see if he has comments on the emergency side. Thanks, Michelle. A, a great uh, question, Councillor. Um, what I what I'd suggest I'll, we can take that away as staff uh, every year or thereabouts. There's a general amendment process through the the zoning bylaw, um, and so. Certainly uh, within this year or in the next little while, 
another general amendment process is uh, is due to be brought forward to council for decision. And um, certainly, I think the zoning staff that uh, that administer the zoning bylaw can can look at that, and we'll we'll bring that forward for their consideration uh, quite quickly. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And I think that was the end of my questions. I had all sorts of notes to the various different line items. Um, so I really appreciate, again, the, the detail that was in this report. It really helped inform. Thank you very much, Councillor Wright. And over to Councillor Hamner. Thank you, Mayor. Through you, I just would like to build on one of Councillor Wright's comments and actually, Michelle, uh, offer my congratulations on the report too. It's been long, long coming and you've done a fabulous job. Just thinking about the, the idea of getting us to a surplus at some point, is there a way that we can consider some of that in swing space as we're looking at, because I have in my mind that demolitions are going to happen as new affordable affordable housing is built. So could there be, and I know it may take us a while to get to a surplus, but we hold some of that as a possibility for not actually losing the affordable housing, but having a spot for people to go while new affordable housing is coming in play. What are your thoughts? Through you, Mayor. Um, we can we can definitely take that back. I, I hadn't uh, incorporated swing spaces, and I, I have to I have to sort of wrap my head around uh, a little bit more what that might look like and what authority we might have to to do something to to enable that. Um, we do have an action in the affordable housing strategy that remind that is intended to uh, ensure that we are reminding landlords of their obligations. For example, in the case of a renova renovation, that they are obliged to give the tenant who is evicted for the renovation an opportunity to come back to the original rental unit. Uh, at some comparable amount uh, in terms of rent. Um, so there were actually quite a few mechanisms in the landlord, uh, or sorry, through the Resi Residential Tenancies Act that do protect tenants who are being evicted because of um, landlord's renovation. choices, uh, either renovation or redevelopment. However, it doesn't cover every situation. And sometimes it's difficult to enforce and we have a backlog of, you know, landlord and tenant tribunal um, concerns. So we'll take that back uh, and look at it. Uh, I think it can definitely be incorporated into the actions uh, that we've we've got in the strategy with respect to looking at mm -hmm. ways that we can create as flexible a housing supply as possible. And, um, and we'll do some more research. Good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Because it, just as you were talking, even if there is something that's protecting them that they can go back into the home in the in the me, in the meantime, they still need someplace to live, and so that's uh, compounding the the problem. Um, Mayor, just one more comment, I guess. Uh, Councillor Vasek started us thinking about and really being excited about getting moving things forward. I think through the conversations that we've had today, it's really demonstrated the need for us to have someone who is over top of all of these projects and coordinating because. I kept thinking with the responses, we're coordinating with the region, we're coordinating just internally and to make sure that all of the moving parts are, are going together. So uh, I, I too would be supportive of, of, of us having someone who is uh, doing that kind of project management on this particular issue. It's pretty critical to get for us to get it right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamner. Uh, other questions from Council? Just a couple of questions myself and echo what others have said about uh, the comprehensiveness of the report and thanks for all the information that's in there. Um, just wondered if you could explain, uh, so I had a question about page 91, it's um, point 1.9b, where it references, um, um, so there's reference there to the green development standards, but I was just wondering in terms of like, the pressing need of climate change and adaptation and mitigation. If um, if you've considered um, other actions that could be taken to help, sorry, I'm just letting you get to that spot there. Just just if there's other actions that you've considered or or that we should be considering in terms of a you know our need to address um, energy efficiency and carbon reduction and just thinking also of um, Mary Jane and 
Patrick's presentation just uh, an hour or so ago around, they made, well, sorry, they weren't presenting on this, but they made some um, comments about, about uh, po energy poverty and things like that. And if there's elements of that, that have you talked to Reap about that in the preparation for this, uh, while you're preparing this strategy, or is that something that we should be pulling into this so that we're we're, we're doing, you know, meeting some of these affordability targets, but also meeting our sustainability targets as well. Uh, to you, Mayor. Um, yeah, we've definitely had conversations with um, various uh, players in the environmental sustainability world, and there is a huge overlap between uh, housing and cl climate change mitigation and adaptation. And uh, we've tried to capture the some of the key ones through the actions in the affordable housing strategy in terms of where we're directing our money we want to make sure that there's you know that those two objectives are aligned i think though that the area of greatest um, opportunity for advancing those uh, shared objectives is through the official plan um, primarily because when it was developed back in 2012 for housing affordability was not on the radar and climate change was there, but um, we've really come a long way in terms of our understanding of how it fits into urban planning and the planning of cities. And so um, we have um, an objective as part of the official plan review and update to integrate those two more wholesomely or fulsomely uh, so that we are setting uh, an expectation in the community that uh, we recognize that there is an interconnection here. Um, and there are a lot of things that we haven't spelled out in this strategy that actually do and have always been intentional to help us achieve both. And one example is uh, by focusing on intensification as a city as opposed to uh, facilitating more single detached homes in low density greenfield areas. We know that we can build uh, more affordable housing that has a smaller carbon footprint through intensification than we could by continuing to develop in the in the periphery of the city. So actually our official plan policies do uh, carry out those types of things with both of those objectives in mind. Um, but yes, I, I, we, we are intending to bring forward more intentional policies that speak to climate change mitigation and adaptation through this sorry, this official plan update that will speak to that. And so we've, while it's very general in the affordable housing strategy, the real um, meat and detail of the analysis will come through back to council for review as part of the official plan review. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much. That's really helpful, which it actually leads to my second question. It's uh, uh, a nice segue because my question was about the official plan and and um, because it hasn't been approved yet, the regional official plan hasn't been, were you, so I guess, first of all, clarify, were you referring to our own official plan or were you referring to the regional official plan? Uh, to you, Mayor, I was referring to the region's official plan that's in front of the province right, right now. Okay, yeah. so my question, thank you. So my question was um, how much of this work might be delayed or will be delayed while we wait for the official plan to be approved, the regional official plan to be approved? Uh, to you, Mayor, uh, that's a really good question. We are trying our darndest to get a phase one to you by this spring, but we also know that there could be uh, another bombshell uh, landing. Please don't use that word. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> another uh, surprise for us uh, down the road with respect to the provinces. Uh, well, one, the review of the region's official plan, and we don't know if all the policies that have been presented in that plan are going to actually be carried forward. And two, we know that the province is merging the growth plan and the PPS together into one unified document. We don't know what that looks like. Um, and it could have significant implications for uh, the authority that we have uh, and that we can use to plan our city. So, um, so all that being said, our objective is to bring forward a, a draft, a phase one draft for council's consideration that will include the housing policies and some of the climate change policies. Um, but we also know that uh, we could be derailed if uh, something comes from the province and it's so significant that it requires us to take a step back and reevaluate. Thank you so much. Um, and I see that uh, Adam Lauder has something that he wants to add to this. I just was, for clarity, the PPS, I don't know if you want a provincial policy statement, if you, I, I don't know if you just wanted to explain briefly what that is. 
or what you're referring to? Yeah, to you, Mayor. Sorry. But, um, yes. So there are a number of guiding frameworks that municipalities are obliged to follow and be conforming with or be consistent with that guide our work. One of those is the provincial policy statement that is released by the province and reviewed, you know, once every five to ten years. And that policy statement sets out what municipalities are obliged to consider when uh, planning and approving development. Um, so when they make big changes to their policy framework, that has big trickle-down effects to our official plan and then in turn to our zoning bylaw. Right. So thank you for that. That's really helpful. And Mr. Lauder, you wanted thank to you. add to Thanks, that? Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Yeah, the, so the PPS, uh, just to, to build on that, the provincial policy statement applies to all municipalities in Ontario. Whereas the growth plan um, does apply to a, a smaller kind of greater golden horseshoe. And so there's the province has signaled through, I think, consultation with, uh, relative to Bill 23, or was it 39? I can't recall that they're going to look to har harmonize those two documents. It might be a little bit complicated given the, the geography that I just spoke to uh, in terms of uh, the various documents and how they apply in Ontario. So we are watching for that and, and uh, certainly are interested in the consultation if they undertake consultation on uh, on the harmonization of those documents. Just on the official plan review, which is why I put my hand up originally, uh, there's a lot of work that we can do and are, are doing now while we wait for the region's official plan to, to be deliberated on and decided by the province. So we're actively working on elements of, and it's identified in, um, also in, in the report that's forthcoming right after the affordable housing strategy, but in uh, Michelle's report, um, there's a lot of work that we are doing on the official plan, like no, looking at nodes and corridors, looking at uh, inclusionary zoning, which would work its way into the official plan review. Um, and so we're not, just wanted to relay that, you know, we're not entirely just waiting for that decision, but we are doing uh, work week to week and day by day to day. Thank you. Thank you very much, but I guess it's fair to say that clarity from the province on, on the official plan or getting approval for it, as well as on Bill 23, Bill 39, um, or any other uh, bombshells, as you said, um, would be helpful for us to do our work at, at and move issues like this and other developments forward. I think that's probably fair to say. Thank you. Um, and just, I was just curious about the secondary suites thing. How long has it been, has, have developers or homeowners had the ability to create secondary suites in the city of Waterloo? Because my understanding is that that's, it's been a while. But it, so then if it has, if it is there, because I see you nodding, do we know why that hasn't really been, there hasn't been much uptake? Uh, to you, Mayor, uh, we did have um, uh, secondary suite policies in our official plan, I believe, since 2012. We updated them to make them a little more flexible in 2019 and then again in 2022 in alignment with uh, provincial direction. Um, but actually, I think it would be fair to say, and, and uh, Adam Lauder's report will speak to this, there has actually been significant uptake in the last three years. Possibly because of the um, the loosening of the policies that were in the official plan, but also possibly because of the increasing demand for housing and the uh, attention that uh, second suites have been uh, receiving in the public. And we know, you know, for example, when Kitchener does something uh, and they they have um, a fairly large announcement about new policies and new zoning bylaw regulations, we sometimes benefit because people in in Waterloo. Uh, start looking and asking about uh, similar programs. And in fact, we had the ability to create coach houses and um, secondary suites already. And so then that can spur interest and uh, construction. So um, I'll let Adam maybe speak more to that. Certainly, yeah, just for additional context, uh, since, and, and I don't want to combine the reports, um, and I, I'm not giving a presentation on, on the report that's coming next, but um, there is a figure within uh, within the report that's coming next. Uh, since 2020, each consecutive year, the number of secondary suites that have come through for building permit uh, has increased annually. And so, you know, you might think of it as a, a nice mortgage helper if you're, if you've just bought a place uh, and, you know, have the ability to then rent out a secondary suite. Uh, certainly there's a lot of action that's taken place at the provincial level 
through uh, Bill 23 to, you know, take that even further and, and really then embed it into the zoning throughout Ontario. And so uh, that's even taking it beyond the second suites, but into third suites. And so if I was to hazard a guess, I think that momentum is going to continue to build and uh, it will really become normalized, I think, in a, in a lot of parts of Ontario, particularly uh, cities where these suites will, will house people. And I think probably at, uh, at a, an affordable rate in some cases. Great, thank you very much. Um, and just one, I think, final question was around um, was around the uh, page ninety three. It's the advocacy piece point one point six D, where it, <clears throat> it indicates that the province you're at, to advocate to the province to update the building code to require a higher pr proportion of accessible units per building. But just for clarification, like the building code is those are minimums, right? And like, I think there's a significant need for more accessible units. I mean, just anecdotally, but also as people age and, and um, you know, mobility changes and that. So I'm just wondering, is this, can we go beyond those minimums um, and set that higher? Do you think there's a need for that? Because uh, I mean, just anecdotally, again, I hear about, um, you know, just a need for more, for more um, accessible, uh, units across our city. Uh, to you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, I think the the wording was uh, carefully chosen there because we can't require uh, more than the building code requires, but we can certainly encourage and uh, uh, facilitate uh, where possible. Um, so I, I think you're speaking to the action where we would encourage uh, developers to build more than the the minimum requirement. Right, or but I might. Yeah, I understand. I, really, what I was wondering is, I thought the building code was kind of setting the minimums, and we could go beyond that. So, can we not go beyond that and say we are requiring you to build? Like the building code says to put X amount in, but we could up that by five or ten percent. Can we? Is that within our control to do or no? Uh, to you, Mayor, I think I'm going to defer to uh, Ron to answer that question. Thanks, Mayor, for your question. Through you. Um, Currently, as it stands now, my understanding is that, um, as we've talked about before, the building, Ontario Building Code sets minimum standards. Um, the province is um, working to enable uh, municipalities that develop their own green building standards to promote higher uh, than the current code allows. My own view is that's going to be a negotiation with developers because if, if there's requirements that are put in place that are too onerous or that don't make sense, we just won't see uh, the activity. If there are uh, very measured and uh, balanced approaches to requiring additional energy efficiency, I think there'll be great uptake on it. So it'll be interesting to see. But as it stands now, uh, my understanding is we do not have the legislative authority to ask for anything beyond what the code currently requires. Okay, thank you. Um but so in, does that cover the accessibility piece as well as the, the climate change and energy efficiency pieces? Is that the same? Um, yeah, to you, Mayor. I, I, I think the accessibility pieces actually are a little bit more flexible. I think we, we have more latitude in making sure that the minimums are met there. But um, in terms of actually requiring beyond what's in the code as far as accessibility, we'd have to check and get back to you. I'm not 100% on that one. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I just, again, um, I, I, I don't know what the demands are out there. I just know that I've heard from a number of people that particularly for um, affordable units that are also accessible is that there's a, there's a significant need in the community. And again, as people age, that's just something that, that becomes sort of a, one level is better for lots of reasons. So just something if you could report back on, I think that would, um, that would be really helpful to know. Thank you. Um, any any other questions, Council? No. Okay. Thank you again um, um, for this report. I think it's as uh, Councillor Hamner said. Uh, you know, congratulations. It's uh, it's very detailed and and significant. And uh, you know, just reiterate as you said at the start that this isn't the start of the work that the city has done on affordable housing. There's a there's a lot of work that has been happening, particularly particularly over the last two to three years on this issue because we're you know understanding more and more our need to step in and where we can to to uh to provide um 
uh, solutions and options and certainly working really collaboratively and in partnership with the region and and um, developers and nonprofits to to address the the concern and and the need for more housing units of all types and varieties so um, yeah so I think it's it's also interesting how integrated a lot of this work is um, across different divisions so you know whether it's climate change or that you know some of the zoning and the bylaw pieces and things like that so thank you very much for this so with that being said um i will look for a mover and a seconder oh pardon me oh so my apologies we have delegation sorry about that <laughs> i put my agenda back up here um so yeah we do have um three delegations the first one is, uh, sorry, let me just get my notes here. The first one is Brooklyn Wallace, who is a member of Waterloo Region Yes in My Backyard. Welcome to the podium, Brooklyn. And um, you have 10 minutes, so um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Brooklyn. Um, I am the chair of the Climate and Climate Change and Environmental Committee at the City of Kitchener. Um, I'm a member at Spectrum and at Fair Vote Canada Waterloo Region, and I am a member at uh, Waterloo Region Yes in My Backyard, uh, of which uh, I present this on behalf of. Um, we enthusiastically support this strategy. Um, it calls for important and long overdue changes that would see the city uh, play a, an expanded and more positive role in promoting housing affordability. Uh, we support measures to allow for the increase in supply and diversity of housing, um, protect already existing relatively affordable supply, and increase the supply of non-market housing. Uh, we also strongly support the strategy's call to explicitly divine, define emergency shelters, um, non-market housing, and transitional, transitional housing. However, we caution that the wording of enabling emergency shelters in appropriate locations um, needs to be written in a way that NIMBY opponents cannot prevent people from getting the help that they need where they need it. Um, areas for improvement include a more thorough commitment to allow uh, for more missing middle housing and mid-rise housing, um, not only in expanded nodes and corridors, but also more broadly throughout the city. Um, the strategy calls for making the above measures uh, more effective in adding housing through uh, reassessing parking requirements, um, something that we absolutely love. Parking requirements make housing more expensive while also being often being unnecessary and encouraging less climate-friendly choices. Uh, we also recommend reduced setbacks and allowing for smaller lot sizes as other ways to make housing more feasible uh, at more affordable rates. In addition, we should look for uh, ways to facilitate more multi-tenant housing and coach houses um, by re-examining bedroom limits and allowing coach houses outside of just laneways. Um, we also support actions 3.1a and 3.1b in particular, as they call for facilitating one-to-one -one unit replacements for tenant displacements um, in the case of rental housing demolitions, and preventing condo conversions of rental houses in cases where rental vacancy rates are under 3%. Um, I actually ran for city council, uh, for Kitchener City Council, on a uh, very similar strategy in mind using information from Amsterdam, um, who do a similar thing. Uh, we particularly support efforts to facilitate non-market uh, affordable housing. Um, one promising such method that the strategy recommends is using city-owned land. Um, this is an excellent idea, especially if we lease this land instead of selling or granting it. Um, leasing, uh, leasing the land in uh, particular allows cities to take advantage of their longer-term planning horizons um, compared to those of developers. Developers are still motivated to rent land due to 
They're shorter-term considerations, while cities have a responsibility and opportunity to steward the land over the long term. Um, we strongly support other measures to facilitate non-market housing, um, such as the uh, increase in revenue to the Affordable Housing Grant Program, um, as well as uh, increasing support to non-for-profit and community land trusts to purchase existing rent rental uh, units. I'll remind you that all, uh, I'll remind you all that co-ops do not price gouge themselves because they would not vote to price gouge. <laughs> um, the city needs more residential housing um, and more types of housing. I will in the next couple of slides, I'll, I'll comment on that. Um, allowing, allowing for more housing types, um, oops, went a little too far. Uh, allowing for more housing and more types of housing gives renters and new home buyers greater choice in what home they live in, what kind of home they live in. Uh, it means that people can be in the house that they actually need and not the one that's just available at the right time. A greater housing supply relative to demand puts downward pressure on the cost of housing, even if it's market rate, even if it's high market rate. Uh, it, the more housing supply lowers uh, the housing costs. Um, a, as uh, we can see here, vacancy rate is strongly correlated to rental rate. Um, I'll also say that multifamily housing is more likely to be affordable. Um, so we need to be increasing the types and numbers of multi-unit housing. Um, we particularly need housing in areas that have traditionally allowed for less housing. Um, more housing choices in areas mean more people, more types of people, um, a stronger neighborhood sense, as well as it means that people who, like, as if, uh, imagine your kid's trying to move out and wants to stay in the area. Right now, if you live in a suburb, that will not happen. Um, they will not be able to afford a single detached house by themselves. Um, so we need types of things for them. Likewise, if a senior is looking to downsize, uh, and they're over house, they don't need a three bedroom single detached house. Uh, their, their options are staying over housed or leaving the neighborhood that they love. Uh, increasing these types of houses everywhere, not just on main corridors, uh, means that people can stay in the neighborhood that they grew up in. Um, not allowing multi-residential housing as of right uh, in many areas, uh, and only facilitating it in some other select areas, contributes to residential segregation. Um, in fact, this was the explicit intent of the uh, historical decisions to begin banning multi-residential homes. Um, they, they did this with the expectation that um, existing racial and class-based inequality will make it so uh, resident or uh, neighborhoods stay segregated, um, stay white in many, in North America. Um, why we support the proposals for facilitating more non-market or in social housing. We enthusiastically support the recommendations um, and we encourage the city to go further still. Allowing for more market housing and diversity of housing types is necessary, but is not enough on its own to make affordable housing to everyone, for everyone. It is a bare minimum. We also need housing that is explicitly created to be affordable. Who else is going to put people above profit if not the city? Isn't that the biggest difference between a corporation and the government? 
is that we don't need to worry about profit margins nearly as much. Um, there are places where we think that we should be going further, however. Um, the affordable housing strategy suggests a uh, can, sorry, uh, ex suggests we consider expanding the geographical space designed, defined as nodes and corridors to allow for uh, more housing in these areas. But as I said earlier, the, the wider spread, the better, the less segregation. Um, I'll also say that uh, allowing it only in specific places uh, leads to an issue where uh, those places, the, the main streets and corridors of the city, are already the most expensive uh, properties in, in the city, um, or many of them. And making those the only ones that can be turned into, house, into more types of housing um, raises their prices just because you have more options with it. And then those costs are passed on to uh, the, the buyers. Um, that's the reason why so much of our housing comes as such high prices, especially in tall buildings. It's, it's so expensive to, to making that. Um, for example, on, this, on the screen, Action 1.3D, um, which would allow uh, three to four story uh, residential buildings in strategic areas, could be applied to the whole city. Um, and in fact, has been, doing, has been done so quite effectively uh, around the world. Um, I basically already talked about that. Um, Just term, you have uh, one minute left. Brooklyn. Thank you. Um, in conclusion, uh, I will just quickly go through a couple uh, issues that I, I mentioned. Um, while the recommendation does allow for more plentiful and relatively affordable housing spread throughout uh, the, the city, um, trying to mitigate housing-based segregation, it still cordons off uh, denser housing to specific areas. We are explicitly saying that poor people can only live in specific areas of the city. Um, and we can't be doing that. I think that's wrong. Um, not only does that lead to the segregation that we've seen, um, but people living with other people of uh, all these different income types lead to stronger communities, um, lead to more diverse communities. It means that we have less polarization, more communication within uh, like out, outside of our just our own economic class. And I'll say that Minneapolis is one of those cities who has done an amazing job. Um, in 2020, when they implemented a major zoning reform, uh, or in 2020 they did that, and in 2022 they're already seeing lower rental prices in actual dollar values even before taking, oops, even before taking uh, inflation into account. Thank you Great. all very much. Okay, for thank you very much, uh, Brooklyn. Um, thank you for your presentation and that information. Um, Council, any questions of the delegate? Councillor Vasek. Thanks, I have, a, thank you Brooklyn very much for your presentation. I agree that um, having, like that poverty is geographically distributed and racially distributed, so I appreciate you highlighting that. I don't actually have a question for you, but I have a question based on your presentation for staff around the city owned lands and leasing it. Is that going to be considered in the in our, our use of city owned lands? Through you, Mayor, yes. Uh, it, uh, I'm thankful to the delegate for pointing that out. It was always intended to be included as one of the considerations. It just wasn't explicitly mentioned, but that will be part of what we look at. Great, thank you. I wouldn't have even known to ask that question when it comes back, so I really appreciate you um, highlighting that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor. Yeah, there's Ross. so many oh. things in that report. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is very thorough. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and you've done a good job. Uh, Yimby's done a good job going through it so quickly. Um, any other questions or comments from Council? Okay, seeing none. Uh, appreciate that the, you've used the word enthusiastic very often, so that's always a great sign. <laughs>
thank from you very a group much. Like, from a group like EMB. So thank you so much. Um, and our next delegation or delegate, oh, there she is, um, Kay LG. Welcome back, Kay. Thank you very much for as well for okay. coming in and um, we'll give you the floor. Right. So I, you're going to find some similar themes to what Brooklyn just said, but um, specifically, I, I've been thinking about affordable housing for many, 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 many years now. And I, I really love the report. It's very comprehensive, well-researched, and all these things. And one of the things is, so I'm just going to highlight a few things that I really liked about it and some places where I think you need to think about going further. So you said there were four key challenges. I think there's five. I think the big, probably the biggest challenge, and for me, let me, let me say, I'm concerned about affordable housing that's defined as 30% of gross income, not the Bill 23 definition that's 80% of the market value. So this is what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about affordable housing of that sort. And I think the housing sector has, has been taken over by investors, real estate investment trusts. And the goal of these investment trusts are to make profits for the investors. So it just, I can't imagine why they would want to build affordable housing. So I think that's a challenge that's right there. And um, so I like all the things that, that you put into the report about an affordable housing grant program, things that support um, non-for-profit housing and public sector. And, and on, on the city-owned lands, I think, you know, I think whether we like it or not, this may be what we have to face doing. And I know it's not a popular option because it's more work and we're not experts in doing it, but I'm not sure we can rely on the housing sector as it is to do it right now. But I, I just underlined don't sell the city lands. The least thing that the Brooklyn brought up is, is, a, is a great idea too. Um, related to that, I think it's really, really important to re do everything we can to retain existing rental housing. Um, and I think there's things in the report about official plan policies looking at demolition, preventing um, demolition. I say it should, not just could, should re include a requirement to provide replacement rental units. And, and I think, I think there's some things in the report to, to try and make it a bit more challenging to demolish. Like right now, anyone can demolish anything. I think there should be environmental standards as well as housing standards. Um, and, and I think this is what you're getting at in the report here. But certainly in, in some cities, there are requirements to provide replacement rental units to compensate tenants for going, uh, for being moved and so on. Um, and I have a little bit more about that in the next slide. But relating to condominium conversion, this has concerned me for many, many years that we've done this. And when you realize that, I think it's what 70% of the rental um, units are owned by co uh, individual condominium owners. And it, it's always worried me when we were converting the, the student uh, uh, housing to con condominiums. What happens when there's no board? Who keeps up the maintenance and so on? So I think it's a, it's a very big concern. Um, but there are cities that have come up with actual policies to, um, to prevent tenant eviction. Um, not just support them, like, which Michelle talked to earlier, like the council people, how you can avoid it, but to, but to say, um, how they prevent it is by just saying to landlords, well, if you evict them, then you have to find, uh, compensation for them for being evicted. You have to find them replaced. They have to be able to move back to similar accommodation, the same affordability and so on when you, when you've completed your demolition and your redevelopment. So Vancouver has some of those which are referenced there. And this is relating to the green standards and, and the environmental concerns. I think this is an important thing. I love to see this in here about the green development standards. And this is something I've noticed about not-for-profit developers is that often they will make their rental units affordable in the long term by making sure that they are built to the highest standards because it does reduce the operating costs. And so it makes the housing affordable. It's not just good for the environment. It does that. And so I've added a point here um, that I would like uh, the city to advocate to the province to update the building code to align with the national model building code. Because our Ontario building code is lagging behind. It's already 
chosen not to implement some things that are in the National Building Code, and I see that will happen again. So I think that's really important, again, if we're looking at the long term and keeping this housing affordable for people. Um, and I'd let, because I'm a retired librarian, I could not avoid the emphasis on the data because, and it is so important. I mean, we wouldn't have this report One minute left, so okay. informative if we didn't have good d data. So that's, that's really key. Um, and I would like to make a suggestion too, but keep the topic alive. Of course, hiring the staff is important. That's one way. We do need a champion within staff and a champion. I think there's a number of champions on council, I can see, but I think this is something you can consider. Instead of an advisory task force which meets as needed, consider creating an advisory committee on affordable housing. And then people can see it on the council agenda. They can see the minutes. They can see, see what's happening with it. And so the last point I'll talk about, and there's been a lot about this, you know, we, like I, like Brooklyn, I, I believe diverse neighborhoods are great. And there's a lot in this report about how to do the planning. That's so amazing, complicated to think about it. But one way that we can get started on it is my plug for Jane's Walks, which I'm coordinating this year. And I think each of you counselors could just do a little walk around your ward and have a little conversation. You know, is this a place where we could have a townhouse? Could we, you know, could we do this? Or, or what would you think if this suddenly, you know, had an affordable housing? Those conversations, because if we don't do that conversations and just bring out the policies, then we get backlash. So those are my plugs, and thank you so much. Thank you, Kay. I really appreciate how you um, you worked in a plug for your Jane walks, <laughs> as well as <laughs> providing your excellent commentary on yeah. uh, the affordable housing strategy. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, Council, does, are there any questions or comments? Um, Councilor Wright. Uh, through you, Mayor, just a quick comment that I volunteer for oh, the Jane's Walk. We can coordinate good, offline. Good, yeah. Um, do. And, and I do think that you've raised a really interesting point. You know, Uptown North, as a neighborhood association, um, is located in an incredibly housing diverse neighborhood with co-op housing. We have um, infill uh, townhouses. We have apartment buildings. We have single family homes. We have student housing. We have seniors housing. Like, you name it, we've got it. And that has contributed to an incredible diversity and social fabric in that neighborhood, which is why so many of us know each other, um, despite not maybe having lived for very long in the neighborhood. Um, so that component of social capital, along with you know the kind of infrastructure that supports it, is so important. So thank you for making note of that. Thank yeah, you, Kent. Oh, yeah, I live in I live in a similar neighborhood, and and I have the other reason I put this in is because I was really involved in the regional official plan. I mean, don't want to pave over farmland, you know, but and there's lots of neighborhoods. But and when I do the lit drops for political campaigns, I'm amazed at how much denser our neighborhoods are, Uptown North and McGregor Albert, than others. And I think, wow, I wonder if we could. So that's the conversation I think would be really fun to have. Thank you. Um, did I see? Yeah, Councillor Rowe. Through you, Chair. Um, I don't have a question per se, um, Kay, but I wanted to thank you for um, your presentation. And I just wanted to make a comment about um, what you were saying about the housing sector being taken over by investors. Um, this is something that I think about um, in terms of people being displaced or not being able to purchase a home if they choose or, or a condominium if they choose. And where do the people go. They may be renters for life if they want to be owners. Do they have that opportunity? Um, and that also goes into sort of the rent eviction um, that we were discussing earlier. So my comment on that is just um, really about community and people based. Um, while investors do provide rentals, what about the people who choose to buy. So I don't have really a question. I don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. I don't know if staff has any input on that either, but I think that's an important point to consider. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Rowe. Any other questions or comments? No, seeing none. Thank you so much, Kay. Appreciate your time here. Um, great. Um, unfortunately, the other delegate um, wasn't able to stay, so that is uh, our delegates are, are done, delegations are done, so um, uh, looking for um, a mover and a seconder 
um, are on the affordable housing strategy. Um, Councillor uh, Hamner is moving it. Is there a seconder? Councillor Rowe seconding it. Um, all in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you, staff. <laughs> nice fist bump there. <laughs> thank you to you both um, and to the delegations who came in today. And thank you, uh, Council. So moving on, we are at the Municipal Housing Pledge, and Adam Lauder is not going anywhere. <laughs> but there's no presentation with this, correct? Okay. So... Um, any questions? There is a recommend. There's three recommendations on the uh, in, included there, but just wondered if council had any questions or comments. Councillor Bodley. Uh, thank you, through Mayor McCabe. So, uh, bear with me as I go through some numbers here, I guess, uh, to try and wrap my head around this a little bit and see and to, to understand where we are sort of positioned uh, in the city of Waterloo. So. Uh, my understanding is that the province has set a target, an ambitious target, of one and a half million new homes to be built in the next 10 years. And my understanding from some of the research that, that I've done or looked at is that there has never been a 10-year period where the province has even built more than 750,000 homes, uh, which is half of this target. Um, our portion is roughly 16,000 homes. And... The report, uh, the, the, the reports here suggest that we are averaging somewhere in the range of 1,200 a year, which would work out to 12,000 homes, meaning that we're about 75% of the way to our target, 12,000 versus 16,000, whereas the, the province has never, never had a scenario where they've actually even, where we've actually even built half. So I guess uh, I, I wanted to ask if, two questions, one, has there ever been a 10 year period where the city has built 16,000 homes as is the sort of aspirational target that we've been given here? And the second question is, you know, given that, is it fair to say that the, the city is, you know, pulling our weight, so to speak, when it comes to housing starts and, and, and uh, allowing housing starts to be built in our community? Through you, Mayor, to, to Councillor Bodley, a great question, a good observation, certainly. Uh, you're, you're right on in terms of uh, Ontario's history, and um, <clears throat> I think it was in the 70s and uh, into the 80s when uh, Ontario was building at a higher clip, uh, which you referenced, which was half of uh, the target that's put out today. You know, and certainly there was a larger role on... Uh, uh, the fed from the federal government on building uh, social housing uh, during that time period. Um, we were also a smaller province, and so you know it's natural to think that as you get larger in size, that uh, more housing is needed, and so on an annual basis or over a ten-year period, yeah, you would uh, potentially need to build more housing. But certainly, I think there's historical context, prim primarily on the federal government's role, uh, which. Uh, you know, paid dividends in terms of the number of units that were brought forward. To your first question, has there been a 10-year period that the city's uh, built at 1,600 on average units per year? The answer is no. And again, keep in mind that uh, we were a smaller city, you know, maybe 20 years ago, we were a city of 100,000 people, uh, residents, and, uh, you know, so fewer units were needed. So as, as the city grows, more units will be required. Um, you know, I would note that uh, there's a recommendation, uh, I think it might be recommendation number uh, is it three, yep, to report annually. And so uh, as we move through the 10-year period, uh, we'll each year be able to check in with council and, and understand what has happened in that particular year, uh, you know, discuss uh, some of the, you know, what might be happening in terms of uh, whether or not there's a recession or or some other slowdown, or you know that housing starts are surprising to the upside, and so we'll be able to to do, do those annual check-ins. And then, could you remind me on the second question? I didn't write it down quickly enough. Uh, are we pulling our weight? Not you right. specifically, but yes. the city. <laughs> yeah, another great question. Um, you know, on the planning side and long-term planning side, it's identified in the report that there's been a lot of work that was done in the early 2000s, uh, as well as the official plan review in 2012, further that work, and then the stationary planning work uh, in 2017. 
And I should also note that the zoning bylaw review in 2018 collectively <coughs> built a lot of capacity and um, additional capacity in station areas will be unlocked um, once uh, the province makes a decision on uh, the region's, region's official plan. And that's identified in the report as to how those station areas could be unlocked. So the city has a long history of um, pulling our weight and punching above our weight, certainly. Uh, in, even if, if you think of intensification numbers that are outlined in the report, uh, over the last three years, I believe the intensification rate is close to 90%, which is very different than other mid-sized cities in Ontario um, that are very still focused on ground-oriented units and kind of building out to the edge of the city. So I would say that the city of Waterloo does fundamentally grow differently than other mid-sized cities. And certainly um, it's my view that we, we are growing, you know, that, that that target is it's aggressive but attainable. And um, I'm not sure that that's entirely the case throughout Ontario. Thank you. I have no other questions, but I do have a comment. If okay, we'll, we'll go to questions first then. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Wright. Thank you. Through you, Mayor. Um, I'm just curious about um, what has, in some housing discussions, been called latent demand or um, the idea of people living with their parents because they can't afford um, housing and so it's sort of like a invisible housing market within our housing market um, because given surplus those individuals would move out of their homes and buy separate homes this is the theory um, and I'll identify that it was partly coming from a smart prosperity institute report that was comparing CMHC data with uh, what the the province had come out with um, so I'm I, again just sort of curious about this um the the numbers and whether we're actually planning robustly enough in order to actually create surplus or whether we're going to end up in a situation where we actually just have latent demand in the system because people can stay with their parents right now um, it's sort of like a, a you know a, a certain kind of calculus housing calculus that i don't think any of us can predict but it's obviously setting some sort of tar target that is ambitious enough to create deep affordability is kind of in the mix of it. So I'm just wondering if you have any comments about that. Great question. Uh, I'm, I'm separating out, you know, the Ontario target versus the Waterloo target. So in Waterloo, we have a good handle on, uh, you know, invisibility on 20,000 units, give or take. And, um, you know, each... Uh, file that comes forward to be honest in terms of pre-consultation it seems like there's a couple thousand more units that are being proposed on a property and uh, of course until those units get built uh, they don't factor or, or permits are pulled they don't factor into uh, our calculations but certainly just going back to the comment around our ability as a mid-sized city to grow um, I think we've been very successful in the development industry very much wants to grow in Waterloo, which is why we have visibility on 20,000 units. And so um, if you think of the forecast being front end loaded and uh, aggressive, the fact that we do have visibility on 20,000 units, I think does say quite a bit uh, in terms of, of all things being equal, the industry's ability to develop in Waterloo. As to um, you know the latent demand, I think it's true that uh, it, it's my own view that first time home buyer buyers are locked out of the market certainly in ontario and cities for sure um you know i think we all see or hear anecdotal evidence that folks are kind of stuck in renting mode and are looking to you know that opportunity to uh to move in terms of buying a unit when they can i'd also say and it's my own opinion that um you know we've been in this very unprecedented housing phenomenon which might or may or may not be a bubble and so things might revert back to the mean and hopefully they do for ho first time home buyers which would give them that opportunity to to move into the market so uh, i think your observations are correct that there's probably there probably is some latent demand within the system folks are kind of not able to move within the system in a way that uh, other generations have been able to um, and so if you think of how that may impact uh, growth going forward, 
if things kind of level out and housing does become more affordable uh, through various ways, um, you might actually see an uptick in growth as folks kind of, uh, the development industry gets that signal that people are, are willing to move within that system. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Did you did you have a follow up or no? no? Okay. Thank you, Councillor Hamner. Thank you, Mayor. Through you, um, Adam, I've I've read the information with uh, with great interest, and I I play on kind of both both sides thinking about it. I think the pledge is great, and I'm glad that we've got line of sight on about 20,000 units coming in. Where I get troubled, though, is how much control do we really have as a city to actually deliver those units to market? And ought we be con be considering something in the pledge that's, um, I don't want it as a, as a way out for us, not really, but, but more of a way of encouraging, obligating, how uh, cajoling, I don't know what you want to call it with the development market. Like we can put a, we can put our numbers up there, but we don't have control over the whole process. And so I worry that we make a pledge and then our response is going to be, well, we've got line of sight on these units coming. We still haven't met our pledge. So it, it's a bit troubling to me that we can't really do all of, all of it. So I ju just your thoughts on, is there something more we should be saying to the province when we're submitting our pledge? Great, great question, Councillor. Uh, I think it is, uh, you know, I th I'm thinking of big city mayors, thinking of AMO. I know a lot of discussions are being had at, uh, at levels outside of the city of Waterloo to remind the province that uh, municipalities, to your point, don't construct units, but we're, we can plan to achieve a target and you know, say that we have line of sight on these units. Um, my thinking is that the, the mechanism of having an annual check-in with council would give us that opportunity to, uh, to have some of that further dialogue if things start to slip. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if more takes place at big city mayors or AMO or, or other tables to, to continue to remind the province that, uh, you know, the development industry really, they, they are the builders. Mm -hmm. um, certainly happy to um, take feedback from council on, you know, massaging the recommendations if, if uh, you see that's warranted. I would say, though, that um, in the report, I was careful to to try to create a little bit of space for that and, and reminder that um, we we don't build the units. I think it's safe to say that the province is hearing that loud and clear as the municipal mm -hmm. housing pledges are uh, are being sent into the province. Um, you know, that's a, a common piece of feedback. And uh, outside of or, or if council were to move this forward, the report in its entirety, which does have some of that language, uh, would be forwarded to the province. Okay, and that's that's helpful, Adam. Thank you for that. Can you share with us how much uh, consultation or collaboration has been had with the development community locally in creating the numbers and, and knowing where we're at? Because you also made the comment that uh, development is strong here and developers want to develop here. So let's leverage that too. Yeah, great question. Uh, we do meet, uh, I think, I believe it's quarterly with the home, bu home building industry. There's an advisory committee. Um, and so certainly have been having discussions with them, uh, you know, as we go along in terms of what the market looks like. Uh, to be honest, um, the housing pledge came up fairly quickly. And so the requirement from the province, uh, you know, there wasn't, wasn't a lot of uh, advanced warning that the requirement was coming. And so, um, I think it's probably fair to say that Ontario municipalities haven't had a lot of time to do a, a very wide spectrum and full consultation with the uh, with all parties on how to meet the pledge. But certainly, um, you know, as we were progressing through to get this report brought forward, it was encouraging that you know again we did have line of sight on quite a lot of units. I would say that. Um, without you know getting into specifics other municipalities that submitted their pledges um, particularly for mid-sized cities aren't in the same position uh, and so there's a lot of work in other mid-sized cities in Ontario that are having to do a lot of um, a lot of heavy lifting and even consultation going forward uh, outside of the pledge but you know in subsequent years with the housing industry to understand 
exactly how they can spur that development, which is a little bit different than here. Than here, okay. And I, I think your your comment that the annual reports would will help us keep an eye on it. And I'm encouraged to hear that there are quarterly meetings, so I would expect or hope to see uh, through those, the, your annual report, just the consultation or the collaboration that's continued to happen so that it is really a, a collaborative effort to reach the number of units we want to see in the marketplace. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamner. Did you have uh, any changes that you wanted to make to these recommendations? And just want no. To I think at, the, at okay. this point, I take I take uh, uh, Mr. Lauder's comment that within the document, which will go completely, there is talk about the need that it's not a one. It's not just a one party. It's three that really have to work work through all of it. And so, as long as we can be emphasizing that, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for that. And yeah, I would just add that uh, certainly through the Ontario Big City Mayors, as well as the um, AMO, I mean, I don't know if people saw that. I think it was a full page ad in the Globe uh, just last week, maybe Saturday or Friday, Friday or Saturday, that had uh, many, many co-signatories co to a kind of an open letter to the Premier to say, to, with some requesting some changes uh, around Bill 23 and with respect to these housing pledges. And, and certainly I'm hopeful, or hoping, I should say, that uh, through the regulatory process that some of those issues will be addressed in terms of like making sure that uh, approvals once they've been fully given by the municipality and we know there's quite a number out there that there's I mean I'd like to see personally a timeline attached to say you know you need to build this by get it started by and have it built by or you know there could be some consequences so I'm hoping that that's certainly some of the things that we're asking for through our advocacy work is to see some of those, some of the, that recognition that it's the municipalities can do this part, the development community, and uh, and uh, and the rest of it can do that part. Um, so thank you for that. Any other questions, council? Okay. Um, so we have the motions and the recommendations. Sorry, the recommendations before us. Um, I just need a mover and a seconder. Moved by Councillor Bodley, seconded by Councillor Wright. All in favor? Sorry, I wanted oh. to make a comment. Oh, my apologies. Councillor Bodley had some comments he wanted to make. Yeah, sorry. Thank Go you. Go ahead. Uh, through you, Mayor McCabe. And, uh, and my colleagues sort of touched on uh, uh, a lot of the comments that I wanted to make here, so I'm, I'm going to be super quick here. I, 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 I hope um, that, the, that the province will actually look to the city of Waterloo as the leaders that we are on this topic and show other mid-sized cities what is possible when it comes to the reforms that they may need to consider as they're looking at their own housing pledges because um, to your point, I think we have we have really been those leaders when it comes when it comes to this stuff. Whether that's through zoning reforms from from years past, or or whether it's through things like our affordable housing strategy that we just approved uh, here today, because the city of Waterloo is still an extraordinarily vibrant community. It's still a place that is extremely desirable for people to live, and um, I think it's great that the province is giving us these sort of aspirational, aggressive targets. Uh, and in our case, they may happen to be attainable as well too, which is awesome. Um, but the development industry has to pull their weight on this stuff uh, as well too. And we, we have to be honest with the fact that the development industry also has some challenges when it comes to things like uh, labor availability and the trades um, and other costs that they are dealing with, but also that they have frankly, their own balance sheets and income statements that are sometimes preventing them from bringing housing to the market. And and I hope that the province will look to some reforms when it comes to those things as well, too. And I just wanted to lastly highlight recommendation number four here, because on top of that, there are significant financial constraints that the municipalities have to bringing uh, the appropriate sort of fiscal planning and and the planning for the infrastructure for these developments forward. And uh, given the challenges and uncertainty that's posed by Bill 23, I really hope that the province is going to come to the table when it comes to uh, providing us with the financial resources and tools that we need in order to prudently plan for the finances of our community as well too. Uh, but happy to support uh, uh, the pledge uh, as it's listed, thanks. Thank you. Any other comments by anyone? Okay. Certainly concur with Councillor Bodley's uh, comments there. And as I said, hope through the regulatory process, some of these issues will be addressed. And, and as the province has said, make us whole. Um, 
and certainly hope that the, that 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 holds true um, in terms of the financial needs we have in order to continue to build a vibrant community. Um, so count, moved then by Councillor Bodley. Is that still? Stand? Okay, we'll move this by Councillor Bodley and seconded by Councillor Wright. Um, all in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Adam. And um, just uh, would like to, I know we have a couple of other, we're running late and we have a couple of other uh, agenda items, but if we could take a t five to ten minute bio break and then resume. Thank you so much.
Okay, we will look to resume in uh, 30 seconds. Did you try the Mr. Puffs? <laughs> I just asked if you tried the Mr. Puffs. Yeah, yeah, they are. Okay, council, we'll bring you back to attention. <laughs> we're that's okay. We're, we're only an hour and a half behind. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, we're not really behind. We've had good discussions. So um, the next item, <clears throat> um, the next item on the agenda is, uh, oops, sorry, we're at eight, sorry, 8D, the additional funding transfer request for King Street reconstruction. Um, there's no presentation with this, but council, um, any questions, comments from anyone? Nope, seeing none. Um, so I need a motion to approve that. Uh, Councillor Wright and, and seconded by Councillor Bodley and uh, all in favor, that is carried unanimously. Um, and then the next one is E, the 2023 Road Improvement Program funding release. Again, there's no presentation with this, but, um, but two recommendations. And again, council asking if people had any questions or comments. Oh, sorry, three recommendations with this, pardon me. Um, any questions or comments with any of this? Um, Seeing none. Actually, sorry, I do have one. I think quick question: Are there with this road, uh, the road improvement program, um, in the development and the work that's going to happen? Are there going to be, is there going to be work that's done in in terms of redesigning roads um, with an eye to slowing drivers and just you know maybe even building in some of those bioswales, um, or is that something that's going to come back in that report that we were discussing earlier? Oh, sorry, I'm looking at the... <laughs> looking at I snuck up while you were talking. <laughs> uh, through you, Mayor, to you. Um, yeah, so anytime we have an opportunity to do a full reconstruction, it's a fulsome design process. So we work with all our partner groups in transportation and city utilities and the rest to sort of um, assess what the needs are on a case-by-case -case and a road-by-road -road basis. So we look at the master plan recommendations, we look at any traffic calming studies or anything of that nature that's available. Um, and that all kind of gets factored in as we go through the redesign. So you, you might have, for example, seen recently on Alexander, there were quite a number of changes made to curb lines, to sidewalks, to eventually some raised intersections, that sort of thing. Um, so that's the type of thing that we look at uh, when we do a full re road reconstruction. So in this particular program, um, we have actually done that for two of the roads that we'll be constructing this year. So Schaefer Street, uh, Teakwood and Thorncrest Place. And then we will be starting design for another four or five that would go next year. So Hillcrest, Langford, Moore, Quickfall and Waterloo. So that's a typical process that we do go through and to make sure that we're capturing all of the opportunities that, that we're not forgetting about things when we're going through the design exercise. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, did you have a comment? Council okay, yep, Councillor Rowe. Through you, Mayor. Um, this actually is an opportunity for me to ask a question that a constituent asked um, regarding the 40 kilometer speed limit. Um, do future road um, reconstructions or, or roads in general, are they geared directly to the 40 kilometer then? Um, they, the constituent is interested in how um, speed impacts how roads are um, fixed or built. Through you, uh, Mayor to Councillor Rowe. So that's pretty new, but it's something that we'll be looking at as we go through the design process for any upcoming road reconstruction. So obviously with a different uh, design speed, the, the design elements can and, and could change. We would still need um, the speed limit, of course, to change through the regular bylaw process and signage process. 
Um, but if we know that that street is going to be designated at 40, for example, we will factor that in through the design process. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And are there, um, so, sorry, and is, with the, with the, the re the road re-improvement projects that you're, that you're, um, that the funding's being released for, for E, is that going to include, or do you know yet if that will include like separated bike lanes? Or is or is that sort of more of a case by case basis? Uh, to you, Mayor. So this funding is specifically for um, what I've called the road improvement program, which is which is administered through engineering services, and it's related to road resurfacing and full depth road reconstruction. So um, when we do the reconstructions, and in some cases even the resurfacing, we as I said, we do look at the needs and we work with transportation services. So it, so it may, through that design process and in cases may, um, include some facilities, but generally we would look to like the TMP in terms of outlining what's required and where um, it wouldn't be on every road. It would be just an, on a case by case basis. Transportation also does have though some, some uh, budget lines for other improvements that they, that they would do um, you know, on their own timing and in their own sort of program delivery models that are sort of separate and apart from this road improvement program that, that we in engineering do. So there's kind of two streams where that could happen. Great. Thank you so much. Any other questions, comments? No? Okay. Looking for a, a mover and a seconder. Councillor Vasek and seconded by Councillor Roach. Um, all in favor? That is carried or approved uh, unanimously. Um, number F. Award of Tender RFT 23-02, Teakwood Drive, Teakwood Place, and Thorncrest Drive, Glen Forest to Teakwood Road Reconstruction. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, need a uh, mover and a seconder. Councillor Roach and seconded by Councillor Bodley. All in favor, that is unanimous. Um, G, the, the Award of Tender RFT, T23-0 Schaefer Street Road Reconstruction. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, need a mover and a seconder. Mover by, moved by Councillor Rowe, seconded by Councillor Roach. Um, that all out in favor? That is <laughs> unanimously approved. H, award of tender, RFT 23-0, annual asphalt paving and concrete repairs. Sorry? I'm happy to move it. Okay, <laughs> moved by Councillor Hamner and seconded by Councillor Wright. All in favor, that is approved. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you to our transportation and engineering folks. And we're moving on to um, the workshop, the strategic planning, the strategic 2023-2026 strategic plan council <laughs> workshop number three. Um, and there was, thank you uh, for waiting. Um, there was a link that was sent by email that we will need council for this, uh, for this um, section. Um, so just to make sure that everyone has that in there uh, available. And uh, welcome again to Sandy Little. And what is, so, um, you're handing, there's a, okay, handing out the instructions. Thank you. Okay, so over to Sandy for, um, for the third presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mayor. Um, good afternoon, good evening, I guess. It's kind of in between the two. Uh, Mayor, members of council, and, uh, and staff as well. So I'd like to welcome you to your third and final workshop in our series uh, on engaging council as part of the new 2023 to 2026 strategic plan. This particular workshop is going to focus on um, establishing a vision and guiding principles as part of the new strategic plan. This is just yet another step in our efforts to have deep and meaningful conversations with, with staff as well as uh, council and our community at large. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Deloitte, who will be leading you through this session. And then I'm going to come on at the very end just to provide some direction and some next steps. So thank you to Deloitte.
Thank you very much, Sandy. Good evening, all, Your Worship, Councillors. Uh, very excited to be here. Um, I, it's always a little bit strange being the last thing on an agenda, uh, be standing between you and your, I guess, now dinner time. But we will do our best to have an engaging and exciting hour. Um, my name is Paul Bean. Uh, I lead our public sector strategy practice nationally for Deloitte Canada. Uh, really, really excited to be here. It was sad to miss uh, the last opportunity when you all connected on this topic with my colleague and I, uh, the combination of illness and, and the weather. Uh, but you know, we have worked through some of our technology kinks. We are excited to be here with all of you. Uh, and I think most of all, this is, in my estimation, and certainly having done this many times, the best part. So uh, talking about vision, talking about guiding principles has a lasting impact beyond each of your tenures uh, to really affect the citizens of the city uh, and to really guide people in their decision making across the entirety of the organization. So uh, with that framing in mind, want to dive in a little bit to our, our conversation here. We'll be doing our best to use some interactive tools. We handed out some instructions. It's a little bit better on your computer if you have it open, which I see a lot of you have screens in front of you. Um, but it works well on your phone as well. If that's where you're more comfortable, it really works either way. Um, and so we're going to look for this to be as interactive and engaging as, as we can possibly be. Um, you won't have to like stand up and do anything silly, uh, but certainly want to, to give an opportunity to have everybody speak and make their voices heard both live and, and in the digital space as well. Um, so him and I will pass back and forth uh, as we go along, but uh, really uh, would encourage you just in terms of uh, a little bit of rules of the road and, and how we want to engage, would encourage you to just sort of think broadly, um, bring your expertise from your whatever your region is, whatever you, the conversations you have with your constituents, but also as a elected representatives, you have a broad thought process on what you'd like to see the future of the city looks like. And I'd ask you to hold that really closely in your thoughts as you work through this uh, next hour with us. 56 minutes or whatever's left. Uh, we will do our best to, to hold to time. Um, so, Hima, do you want to jump up and start us into the first exercise? Hi, everyone. Uh, Your Worship Mayor, Councillors, again, thank you for having us here again today. Uh, so, we'll just kind of dive right in here. So, Paul already talked a bit about what we're going to do today around the vision and guiding principles, so I won't spend too much time here. Um, but we just wanted to give a quick recap of what we did discuss uh, about a, three weeks ago, three and a half weeks ago. Um, and so if you remember, we, we got, you got your input on the mission. I know we promised to take that away and come up with a beautiful mission statement, and that is coming. Uh, for now, we wanted to show you what were some of the key themes that came out of that. And I think when you look at these, it should be, you know, uh, it should resonate with what you kind of did uh, a few weeks ago. And nothing here, hopefully, should be much of a surprise. But, you know, we talked about diversity, equity, inclusion, the mission being quite future-focused, uh, and when looking at that sustainable growth and innovation in order to be future focused, um, while also keeping in mind to be economically stable, fiscally responsible, um, and to be really that community centric and welcoming uh, community of Waterloo. Um, being responsive and transparent and you know, affordable access to basic needs. So these were some of the key themes that we, that we had discussed or that you came up with uh, last time we talked. Uh, any, any questions on these? Um, through the mayor, uh, through the mayor to councillors, or anyone want to, if any questions on what we uh, discussed last time? Can I just make before we dive into that? Can yes. I just do a check with council that they're logged into the the email link worked and that we're no okay? Because oh. I I mean I I missed most of what you just said. I apologize because I was just checking no problem um, checking to to see if I was in the right uh, board here. So just maybe pause for a second sure, to make no sure so we can concentrate on what yep. you're saying. Like when I open mine, it says what, City of Waterloo Strategic Planning Session Part 2. Is yep. that the right? That's right. Okay. That's the right one. All yep. right. Okay. Uh, I, see a, a, I see a few folks with it up. So yeah. The, yeah, that's what it should look like for now. Looks like you're in the right spot. Okay. We're just getting you prepared. We're not going to use it for, for a few minutes. No, I realize yeah. that, but I, I just was worried that a few are, well, myself, we're just yeah, a no bit problem. distracted <laughs> just making sure we're logged on there and not... Uh, not fully paying attention to you, good. I may. Yeah. So, are we good then? Yep. We're all okay. Councilor Roach, you're okay? Yep. Okay, great. Okay. Sorry. So, no, no problem. No problem at all. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. And we're you. not, yeah, and I know we're running a bit behind time, but okay. <laughs> we're, we're all good. We're all excited about this kind of, uh, this kind of work. So, Absolutely. We're, we're attentive now. At least yeah. I am. <laughs> yeah, no, hopefully we can have, uh, have some fun like we did last time. Yeah, as well. great. Thank you um, so much. No problem. So, Samir, just to then, as you mentioned, you were kind of uh, going through getting on the, on the site, but so 
again, this is kind of some of the key inputs that we discussed last time. So we haven't, we don't have that beautiful poetic mission just yet. But these are the types of themes that uh, we're that are going to be that are going to be worked into that, right? So DE and I, um, that future focus with the sustainable growth and innovation, uh, while still remaining remaining kind of economically stable, phys fiscally responsible, uh, and really having that community-centric, responsive, transparent uh, kind of city, uh, city of Waterloo. Um, and the last piece there around kind of that affordable access to basic needs. So any questions from the councillors, Mayor, to yourself? Um, any questions on what we came up with last time? Uh, any questions, concerns? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Councillor Vasek. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I think it, you captured a lot here. And um, I just wanted to highlight it again. It wasn't exactly a theme, but I just wanted to flag it because I do think it is important, which is that um, I, uh, I think we all loved future focused. And so I'm wondering if what I'm thinking could be incorporated there, but I don't think so. But I really think there is an element to the pandemic recovery of being in a unique period of time where, where we're trying to figure out yeah. what the heck has happened where are we now and where do we want to go? Like as a document that will, um, uh, you know, all these documents are his historical records in some way, right? Absolutely. And and by not capturing that we've just gone through a pandemic with lasting effects, seems like a missed opportunity. So yeah. those are my thoughts on on this. Otherwise, that looks like it captures it. Through the mayor to Councillor Vasek. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, you know, when we think about this, I think when you originally did your pre-read, actually, you were part of the one of the prompts was to actually think through what has changed as a result of the pandemic, and I think that prompted a lot of what came up here right now. So, you know, it's important for us to to think about that as we actually capture the mission and, and really realize how it fits into each one of these individual themes. Paul? Just to interject, it, would it were something along the lines of like new normal or next normal? Is that like something that that sort of has that? historical record piece to it but where the so where the naming of it lasts that 2027 lifetime but we can build into it some of that thinking does that sound about right yeah i don't okay. really I, I don't at this point have a sense of where it ought to be gotcha. it was just something that was really um i felt strongly about last time that's great and it's not captured here and yeah. i'm not the only person on council so it may not be the most important thing um, but the only reason I flag it is because I, I do feel like it's really important. So um, wh wherever it goes, if that's it goes great. anywhere at all. Hmm? No, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vasek. Any other comments, questions? Thinking about it? Okay. <laughs> I guess my only comment just to, to your question, Councillor Vasek, is if it's what you're describing, which is, it's, it's important, right? Because um, personally, I don't really like the term new normal so much, but, but like, um, are some of the, are some of what you're describing going to be captured in like, you know, now we're talking about affordable access to basic needs and more around diversity, equity, and inclusion and, and the vibrant community type, um, like if, if it kind of, if that would kind of be underneath some of that or, I think for me, it was like, so I did a double major in university, one with history. And so I imagine if someone were looking back at the city of Waterloo documents and were to look at only all the strategic plans and looked at the 2022 to 2026 strategic plan and didn't see anything about recovering from a pandemic, they would miss a piece of history, for example, right? So I think it's, it's, it, it's um, important to to capture that and also to recognize that that is an experience that every single one of the constituents in this entire city has gone through um, and, and been impacted by. So I think it needs to be explicit in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Council. Yes, absolutely. We will make sure we noted that down and uh, when we're coming up with the final mission, something we'll uh, make sure to work in and uh, for, for your review and next steps. Um, Great. So we'll keep going then. And um, so really the focus of today's conversation, one of the two focuses is on vision. And so one of the things we always run into a little bit is what is the difference between mission and vision and mission, excuse me. And it's a bit, it's a bit tricky, a bit murky area. So we want to just kind of provide this 
side by side comparison, if you will. Um, again, this wasn't the brewery that went out, but just to, to refocus it here, it, what you did last time was around the how the organization, or in this case, government, makes strategic choices to pursue its future state. So really, it's it's whose needs will you be addressing and how, you know, how will the city of Waterloo position itself in the broader ecosystem? So these are the types of conversations you had in the previous session. Today, when we think about vision, it really can, you know, while that was about the how, the vision is really about the why. So what is it, what does the city of Waterloo really stand for? What is the compelling, ambitious future state that the that city of Waterloo strives to achieve? And so when you're thinking about that, when we have this, when you're thinking through some brainstorming right now, really think of these questions, which is, what is a clear, compelling, one sentence story, the main objective purpose for the city of Waterloo? And what's the future, you know, and thinking a bit further on that, what is the ideal future state aspiration? Uh, when you think about your evolving external environment, uh, going back to, to, to Councillor Vasek's point as well. So again, that's what we'll discuss today. Uh, we'll get your input on that like we did last time. Um, and, and we'll just kind of go through these slides and, and we'll, you know, if you have any questions, we'll kind of cover them at the end and we'll, and we'll get into our brainstorm as well. Um, so if you think about that definition, definition of a vision, um, again, we've just provided here a little bit of what makes for an impactful vision, right? So we talked about some of these things, clear value, responsive. It, it's a powerful kind of one sentence phrase or, you know, one piece, uh, but one, one sentence summarizing that. Um, simple, unequivocal language. But having said that, behind each term, there is something that goes behind it. And we'll talk about that in our next, in our next slide as well. Um, it describes an outcome, it evokes emotion, right? It represents a call to action, that reason for being. And so we provided some examples from your neighbors, uh, not to say these are best practice or whatever it might be, but just examples so you know what's happening kind of around being, you know, Cambridge, Guelph, and Oakville. And so, you know, I won't have to go through each of those, but you'll see those on your screen there as well. Um, and so, that point I brought up just in the previous slide a bit about, you know, while it is a simple one sentence, simple language, it's with one phrase, that doesn't mean there's a lot, there's not a lot behind it. And so we want to kind of show you that with, with a vision statement that, that, you know, we had worked on with, the, with a different government organization. And so their vision was by 2030, everyone in Canada has a home that they can afford and meets their needs. And so that's a kind of one sentence, it gives you reason for being everyone in the organization can point back to that and say, this is what we're trying to achieve. So whatever we're doing, is it, is it in accordance with this particular goal? But what goes into that? If you think everyone in Canada, what does that mean? It means all people physically living in Canada, regardless of citizenship, has a home. Then there's a definition on what that actually means. So a dwelling that provides dignity, safety, stable space, a place, excuse me, to participate in Canadian society, regardless of the type of housing they can afford. So particular definition on what that means. So less than 30% of before tax household income. And that meets their needs. So it's suitable to particular housing needs of that particular individual. And so again, why we want to show you this is though it's a simple, simple statement, there are key pieces that go behind each particular term within that. So just food for thought as we think about what that means for the city of Waterloo. And then finally, just to provide you with uh, you know the, the current vision statement again just as, a, as an input to your thinking is you know Waterloo is an equitable community that leads the world in learning discovery and caring so before we get into the exercise just want to again pause to see if there's any uh, questions through through you the mayor to any counselors if there's any questions uh, that we can help answer council any are we good okay looks like we're good for now okay go great. ahead Keep going. Yeah. So then what we'll do is we'll switch over to our, our clock soon board and the exercise and, and um, we'll give you a few minutes to brainstorm. But what we want to do, and I'll, sh I'll show you this and then I'll switch over to the board uh, online. But the question that we're thinking of here is similar to what we did last time around the mission statement, right? Is what are some key concepts, some key phrases, things that you want to show up in the vision statement for the city of Waterloo and you want to bring forward into the current vision? So. We'll give you a few minutes to, to get that down on your clock soon. Again, I, I think we confirmed everyone's got it open, so we're okay. And you'll see there's a board on the kind of the left bottom portion that you can input your, your, your stickies. And if not, we can do that uh, manually as well from up here. So while we're giving you a few minutes to do that, I'll just set it up on this screen as well. Any questions? I think they already di are diving Perfect. into it. All right, everyone's diving in. <laughs>
You're having trouble finding your own st the stickies you just wrote? We're just moving some of your stickies around as their themes are already starting to emerge. So don't worry if yours isn't where you placed it before. Yeah. If anybody's having any issues, just flag me down. I'll come come say hello. Some really great evocative words coming through. Momentum. A lot of lot of caring, equitable leaders, leadership, vibrant is a great word. Some really good. Really, really good words coming through. Just check, time check, um, how many more minutes do we think we need? Um, how about we do another minute? Does that work, Council? Another minute? Okay. I'll start a timer here. Okay, council is that does anyone need any more time? You, if nope. people want to keep scrolling away, Mara, while we're uh, okay, while we're while we're chatting, I have a few. I would just love to have get uh, whoever wrote them, or if people want to weigh in on them, that I think are really interesting. Climate proof only came up once, but it's very interesting, and I was wondering if someone could just tell us what they had in mind when it, when they were thinking about. I don't know who wrote it, but whoever was thinking about that, because I think it's a really interesting idea and a vision statement, and certainly quite topical given the way you've spent the rest of your afternoon. Does does the whoever wrote that want to give us a little bit more of just what was on their mind in that statement? Sure, that was me. Oh, okay. That wasn't on purpose. I really don't know who wrote that. <laughs> um, well, I mean, yeah, like you just said, it's um, personally, it's the reason why I ran. I just think ah. we need to be making with the climate uh, crisis that we're that totally. we're in continue we're in the middle of, and that's continuing. I think that it's um, you know there's lots of really important issues that uh, our community and others face, but I think unless we kind of can totally. figure out how to um, how to better live in the climate we have and, and adjust to what's coming and try to be as sustainable as possible so we don't make it any worse. I think, you know, some yeah. of the other issues 
all the issues matter, but that's like an overarching Absolutely. One. Well, and it's right. interesting. So, and I, part, part of what I was trying to get to, Mary, and this is, I think you've answered it well, is you can't really be future ready if you're not climate proofed. Right, as part of as part of why you grouped it together, I really like that. Okay, the other one, th there's two more that stood out for me. Fun and creative. That's that. Only, that also only came up once, but I'd love to. I I get the creative piece. I've been to Waterloo many many times in my life, but fun and creative. Somebody purposefully put that one on the side. Who was that, and what were that they? That was me. Again. Okay, this is definitely. Not, I want to be 100 percent not on purpose. So I care about the climate and I care about a place to have fun too. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. no, I just think, you know, there's the expression live, work, play, but it's also mm. like you want to mm, have yeah. a community. I think I want to have a community where I can have fun where, I mean, and I think that's just an important part of life, right? Like yeah. that my kids find it like a fun, desirable place to live, that other people yeah. find it a, a, a place they can enjoy it, not just live here. That, I feel like that's underneath a few of these where, you know, prosperous, like there are lots of ways to prosper. It's not just about dollars and cents. When we talk about vibrant, it's a vibrant place to live. So I take that that point, uh, Madam Mayor, and then it's very interesting, I think. Because the, the last one I just wanted to, to push into was we lumped risk takers with the Innovate Group in that bottom left box. Uh, but I don't know who wrote risk takers, but is that what you meant? Like, I don't want to poorly. That's me again. <laughs> now, it, now it just seems like it's. All <laughs> this <laughs> no, seems like we, we know. set this up or yeah, something like that. Yeah, this is, like uh, this is not how it's supposed to go. Anyway. Uh, no, well, I, um, in, what I was thinking was that, um, you know, to be a, to be leaders, it's, um, and, or to be an aspiring leader sometimes involves taking risks. Governments are, you know, in count and, and you know, we're t particularly municipal governments sometimes are a little risk averse with totally. very good reason. But, uh, but I think, you know, um, given what we, the type of community we want to build that, and sometimes the, the urgency with which we need to adapt and adjust to the various issues and demands sure. and opportunities that we need to be able to have that mindset to say, you know, we're going to take a few risks, you know, do that fail fast and, and keep moving. Okay, so I feel like it's it's grouped in the right spot. Fail fast, be innovative, but not be on a be unafraid to try different things. And okay, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. And I think staff need to know, like, if if that stays in here, <laughs> like staff and council and the community need to know that that's again, if it stays in here, that that's that that's they have permission to do that yeah. in our community. I like I like that. There's a little bit of like a culture shift underneath it as well. Like maybe not shift, but there's a cultural element to it as well. Like we want to bring that to every. Okay, that's great. I've highlighted the, the three that really stood out to me. If there's anyone, Mayor, through you to council, anybody look happy to take a couple if people wanted to define what they meant by what they wrote. That certainly don't. There's a lot. A lot of it is fairly self-explanatory. But if you, if there's any where you were sort of like, hey, I really want, I really meant this by that. Happy to take that for a minute. Council, anyone want to um, add their thoughts? No. Okay. 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 Great. Yeah. So, so, you know, again, as we talked about, a lot of emerging themes coming out of here, right? And so, you know, it, it will be our job to take these and, and kind of figure out what, what the right vision statement is going forward. I think, you know, one of the things we do want to do with you, though similar to last time, is we want to, you know, now that you've seen what people are thinking, obviously you've had a chance to opine yourselves, you've seen what other counselors are thinking as well. Uh, what we were hoping to do actually is to get you to come up with your own vision statements, right? Similar to what we did last time. Um, and from there, we can start to get to see where how some of these themes are resonating with, with more people. Uh, because obviously, we can't fit all of this into one statement, right? That's, it'll be quite long. Um, and so we'll have to, you'll have to think through what is it that's kind of most important to you? What is it that you most want City of Waterloo to strive for and achieve? Um, and not to say, again, some of this stuff can't come up it will come up and the mission will come up when we talk about guiding principles as well. Um, but from a vision perspective, your reason for being that why, you know, we'll leave it to you to think through what is it that's most important to you to highlight that way. So I'll just actually shift over our board here and we've got another question here. So you don't have to do anything, you don't have to change anything, still same process, add a sticky and we'll give you a little bit of time to just think through what is it that you would draft as your vision if you were to select it for the city of Waterloo. Yeah, and we'll give you a few minutes to start, uh, and then we'll check in as that's happening, and we'll have a discussion on it once we've got those. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank I'll you. set a timer for five minutes. Does Perfect. That okay.
Also feel free to try a couple, like you don't have to limit yourself to just one and being done. Like if you want to test out a few different ideas and throw them up on the page, I think that's a great idea. More is more at this stage. So don't be afraid to throw a few up. That's good. Some people are already doing that. So I just want to make sure everyone felt the permission where it's like, you don't need to, I've, I've never gotten this right the first time in Councilwoman, so great. I love it. Still a minute and a half left, no pressure. Well, and once you're finished, if you, if you feel like you've finished all the writing, feel free to give a read to the, the rest there, because we're going to do a bit of a, of a review of what's on the board. So if you want to give them a read once you're finished, that's great too. Okay, that is uh, five minutes. So um, unless anyone needs any additional time, back to you. <laughs> awesome. Great stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So so again, thank, thank you all for taking the time to participate and do that. Um, you know, again, a lot of the key themes naturally are coming out in these visions, as you might imagine. But what we're also seeing, though, here is that they're, they're more focused, right? If you think about, we had a lot of different themes in the last in the last exercise, but what you've kind of seen is what certain things are resonating more with certain people and in terms of what they come up with here. So obviously a lot of stuff around community, around the inclusive climate ready city, uh, vibrant, innovative community, right? So community focused, uh, innovative, climate, climate ready, right? I mean, these are kind of the key themes that are coming out of, that are coming out of a lot of these. Um, again, not to say one of these is better than another. It's, it was just simply a way for us to understand kind of what, where some of the thinking lies amongst the different counselors here. So we're going to have a, you know, we're going to give you the opportunity to kind of opine on, on some, some different visions you're seeing here or potentially elaborate as well. Um, but there's actually a function you can use where take a second just to read through the different visions we have here. Um, you, if you just click on, I'll just show you on my, on my screen here. If you click on one of these, for example, just pick the first one, you can click a heart. So it's, hey, is this, is this one really resonating with me? You know, or, or is this one one that's really kind of, you know, something that I could really get behind or see really, really you know, get behind for the city and see that actually becoming the city's vision. Um, and so really, we're just going to get an idea of where exactly some of the more, some of the prior, prioritization kind of for some of these visions. So I see someone's already started to do that, which is great. 
Um, it's a good anonymous way to help us get a sense of what's resonating yeah. for folks and and where there might be some. There, were, there is a fair amount of coalescing already, which is which is great because you see it in the language. Yeah. It's also nice to see hearts all over a board. It's just a nice feeling. <laughs> so we'll give you a little bit just to do that. No, oh, and I'll fix this as we go. All good. All right. So, uh, sounds like it looks like some of the voting has kind of stopped now, or the you know the hearts have stopped now. So, just picking out a couple of them that kind of keep bubble up to the top here. So, one that was really resonating with folks was to build a vibrant, future ready community for all. Um, the other two that kind of are as well really resonating are around the connected, connected, inclusive, climate ready city that embraces change, new ideas where everyone thrives, and you know, a vibrant, innovative community actively creating an equitable, equitable, and sustainable future for all residents. So. You know, no need right now to kind of tell us which ones you liked, which ones and which ones uh, you kind of put a heart on. But does anyone want to share kind of what you know potentially resonated with them from those you know those top three that we've got there right now? Councillor Rowe, um, through you, Mayor McCabe. I think um, a couple of them <clears throat> that stood out to me are the ones that are active. So mm. um, actively creating an equitable and sustainable future and building a vibrant community. So those jump out at me initially um, because that's something you can envision and that yeah. it's you're, you sort of see the city are, as um, the city of Waterloo Corporation working towards uh, building that community. That's great. And in partnership with uh, the residents. 100%. That's great. Other comments? Uh, Councillor Wright. So just similar to Councillor Rowe on the idea of the active language, um, where we can talk about um, embracing change, learning and discovery, you know, that there's that there's momentum behind it all. Yeah. Well, then it gives that sense of connectivity, right? Like we're doing this together. I think you're both sort of saying that. In, in different ways, which is great. Sorry, hey, nice Councillor Hamner. Thank you. Thank you. I like I like the ones that are action oriented. Also, I also think of the ten second elevator speech and sure. what can I remember. So it needs to be short yeah. and and inspirational at the same time. And I guess knowing that the mission, vision, values kind of all fit together. So to me, we're starting with that higher, uh, more far-reaching kind of comment and then the mission statement gets into more detail of what we're going to do and then how we're doing it is through the values so i kind of think of all all those three together i think inclusion and that's the piece that struck me uh the most so keeping action oriented and making sure that it we're talking about the community as a whole and we're speaking to our our own organ our own community but yet where to, where's our place in the bigger system too that's great yeah, and, you know, it's a, it's a great point. And again, as, as we talked about earlier, it's at this level, you're thinking, what is it that, what kind of statement can we look at and say, look, every, whatever we're doing is kind of geared towards this. This is our North Star that we're trying to get to, right? Um, and then at, to your point, uh, Council Member, absolutely, uh, you know, the mission gets a little bit more tactical around that. And then finally, you talk about how, what kind of values you're going to embody, you know, as a city in order to achieve these things as well, which is our next conversation. So it's a great segue. But before we get there, I want to Mayor, Mayor, through you, if any other councillors have any, any other thoughts they want to share. Sure. Yeah. Other comments? Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Bassett. I, okay, I'm going to sound like a jerk, but I just hate the word innovative. That first one's great. Whoever made it, it's great. Um, it's just the word innovative gets to me. And I think that some of the um, other things that we've talked about around um, leadership and risk taking and curiosity are the things that underpin innovation, perhaps. And maybe I'd be more inclined to go that route. I just really don't want to see innovative come back. 
No, no. Look, I, I think it's a really, it's a really fair point. The word innovative has been beaten pretty, pretty. It's been flogged pretty hard for a really long time. I think it still summarizes well the, some of the things you're naming. But to your point, like, and I think a, a few of you have made this point today, and I think it's great. Is the the idea that actually we really want to dig underneath that and talk about the kind of leadership, talk about what it takes to be like to what does it take to be innovative versus just being innovative by some sort of magical thing. And I, and I think that makes a lot of sense to to, to me. Great. Other comments? Oh. Okay. Yeah. Go great. ahead. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is great. And, you know, again, this is this is a start. This is the input. It's similar to what we did for the mission. This we will, you know, it's our job to take this, come up, come back with something which you all, you know, you all react to. So, um, appreciate the input here for sure. Um, and so, uh, what we're going to do next is actually talk about guiding principles. And so, I'll just switch back over to our deck for a second here um, and we can talk through a bit of that. So we've talked about the how, we've talked about the why, the mission, the vision. Now we're thinking about, well, what are you going to, what is every individual here going to do in order to embody the, that mission mission and vision? Excuse me. And I know that you know, right now you don't have necessarily that final mission, that final vision, but you've got an idea now of what that's going to entail based on our conversations. And so, as I mentioned, the guiding principles really around they convey how every individual will behave and make decisions in the pursuit of the mission and vision. So, you know, it's really when you're thinking about strategic choices you're making, when you're thinking about different decisions that are happening, it's, it's what are we going back to the whole time? What are the values, the guiding principles we're going back to in order to make those types of decisions, in order to help us move forward? So, um, you know, if you look at that last phrase there, what are the ideals that the city cannot put aside, right? Keep that in mind. And so... Again, we've listed the current guiding principles here, equity, inclusion, sustainability, fiscal responsibility, healthy and safe workplace, effective engagement, personal leadership, service excellence. And so, you know, the, the, the phrases or sentences after that, that's kind of a description. But what we're really hoping to do here is really start to identify what are those key, key terms, those key guiding principles, so what you see in bold there. Um, what are those that, that you want to kind of embody as the city of Waterloo? And so... Again, we'll, we'll have a discussion on that and we'll get your input as well, Back going back to the clock student board. But before we do, uh, again, Mayor, through you to councillors, uh, any, any questions on, on this piece? Sorry. Sorry, I was reading that. <laughs> no, I was reading that too. Got caught up in the moment. Councillor Hamner. I guess a comment and a bit a bit of a question. When we're thinking of the guiding principles, to me, it's we need to be pretty clear on who the audience is. And typically, when I think of guiding principles or values, it's speaking to those that are part of the corporation. So in this case, it would be council staff, vol um, volunteers that we have, opposed to the community at large. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and, and in that in that um, vein, like I don't think there's a need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So inevitably, some of the words on this page are going to resonate with you still, as they should. And so I think to your point, though, all of these are oriented in that way towards the corporation. And I think continuing that thought process um, would be would be wise and helpful. Absolutely. Okay, so we'll have you go back to your the Claxton board, the interactive uh, board we were using. And give you a few minutes again. And again, don't worry about putting the full kind of sentence that you see on the end. It's more so those bolded terms, right? What are those key guiding principles, uh, Councilor Hammer, to your point, that the corporation will embody, right, in order to achieve that mission, vision and mission that we that we started talking about as well. So um, I'll switch back to the board, um, but we'll give you five minutes again uh, if you'd like to uh, get your thoughts done, and we'll have a discussion about it after that. Tell someone definitely did their pre-read and came prepared with uh, <laughs> yeah, that. There's, there's a pre read warrior in here. I love it. That's uh, that's awesome.
Okay. Um, are we ready? It's a full board. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty great. full board. <laughs> no, it's wonderful to see you. Okay. I, I guess if you wrap, wrap up if you've got some last minute ideas, but otherwise we'll turn it back to you. Yeah, no. So again, really appreciate the input here. Uh, I think, you know, th th there's, there's a lot to unpack here, so we're not going to get through it in 10 minutes. Uh, so in, 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 in fairness to that, uh, maybe we'll open it up to see, you know, I think if anyone wants to share any particular through the merit of counselors, if you want to share any particular ideas you want to highlight, that you want to maybe talk about, or, or, you know, ones that are maybe really important to you that you kind of put up here, um, and we'll, we'll generate a discussion that way. Council, did you have or questions about things you see up there, or if you want to speak to something that you put up there, go ahead. Answer right. I just want to speak to something I put up there. So you know, we spend a lot of time talking about how, how um, being future ready or climate proof or climate ready is is needs to be part of this picture. Um, earlier today, the UN made an announcement about how um, countries around the world need to move up their targets by ten years. Um, so I particularly want to point out bold and ambitious because business as usual is not going to work. Yeah. We will not reach any of our goals if we are not bold and ambitious. Thank you for that. Mayor, may I just ask a question to Council Wright on yeah. that? Of course, uh, yes. To the Mayor, you to Council Wright. So, uh, and so on that, so when you're talking about the bold and ambitious, you mean uh, across the board, particularly in regards to climate, yeah. to climate action? It actually needs to be across the board across, because yeah. when we talk even about equity or coming out of the um, pandemic period that we've been in, um, there's an opportunity. There's a window for us right now. And so that's, you know, I've been using a lot of language around momentum and being very action focused, opportunity, possibility focused. And that window is going to close. And so we actually need to seize it now. There's a lot of urgency there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Um, other comments by anyone? I think Councillor Bodley's thinking of something. Okay. Um, so I'm the I'm the loser that did the pre-read and wrote everything. So <laughs> pre-read warrior, pre-read warriors. We lo we love to see it, Councillor. We love to see it. <laughs> I was here all day Friday uh, <laughs> celebrating St. Patrick's Day by myself. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Um, no, so I just, I wanted to highlight, one of the things that I really struggled with from the last uh, numbers, uh, our last number of, of strategic uh, uh, or guiding principles was fiscal responsibility. And I, I saw that that was on here. And that's why I was really trying to figure out how to put fit, f fiscally, re being fiscally responsible with with the affordable housing crisis and and how do we make an affordable community, but not an affordable, like, the, and so I was kind of looking up like synonyms and things for affordable and like the biggest synonym that comes back for affordable is cheap. And, you know, I don't think we want like cheap housing. Um, I don't think we want a cheap community. Um, and so I think that's why I had just written and I think fiscal responsibility is is something that I struggle with a little bit because fiscal responsibility is often thrown back into the face through a council lens of well you can't raise taxes to do anything um, you can't you can't actually achieve any of these other goals because you need to be fiscally responsible so it's something that I, I, I struggle with and that's I just wanted to highlight that that's why I came up with the, the term economic justice or not that I came up with the term but that, that that's where I sort of landed on um, that sort of speaks to the fact that we, we want to make it this a place where it, it, it also I guess speaks to livability but livability for everybody I, I, I guess in the community so I just wanted to highlight that was the thing that I struggled with the most when I was trying to come up with thing uh, principles to come forward with it's interesting you use the word dignified in in it as a, as a different word than livability and I think it's well placed in where you put it but I it's it's I wouldn't have read that as, as fiscal sustainability so thank thank you for that because that's really helpful thank you councillor Bodley no that is a that is a good point because it's it is something that municipalities struggle with particularly since we're being limited with some of our fiscal tools but that was a previous conversation councillor Vasek yeah, I just wanted to highlight one that I put here because it does it's not really grouped with anything and it can't really be, but the idea of being in solidarity. I was gonna ask about that one. Which really is about um uh being with people uh wherever they're coming from. And so like when we're on council, 
This this applies to social justice movements and climate action, and it, it applies to those kind of big things. But I think the things that we, one of the things that you struggle with as a counselor is that um, everyone just wants you to understand where they're coming from, and you kind of can't be all things to all people. So what does it mean to be with people when you're trying to serve serve them? And so I also don't entirely know what I'm trying to capture with this, but other than we're in a really tough time in the world, both like with, with climate, with, I mean, thanks, this is great, Rice. Social justice, this captures it. We're in a tough time. And it requires of us in order to move forward, being with people in a really compassionate way, um, kind of wherever they're coming from, which doesn't mean that we're going to be able to do everything for everyone. We're not, you know, but, um, but um, yeah, that as a city, how can we be with people? And it, it's kind of about transparency and it's kind of about customer service and it's kind of about being connected, but it's about really kind of um, just being with people differently under trying better to understand where they're coming from um, on just a surface level, I guess. Anyways, I hope that clarifies a little bit what I mean there. Super helpful. And I, I was going to ask about that one because it was, it, it did pique my interest for sure. And I think it's an, an it, it's very interesting in the way that you've described it, sort of like being supportive as a, as a city and as a corporation for, for citizens, but not necessarily supportive just in a doing things dollars and cents way, but beyond that, like how do you create that? And I think it, it tracks back maybe to some of the other words around compassionate and caring that we had on the previous page as well. It feels like it tracks back a little that way too. Is that a fair addition? Yes. I, 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 the only thing I would distinguish between is support, yeah. which is that support it can be um, lending. I think solidarity is a bit more active. Yeah. Thinking back to how Councillor Rowe kind of framed an earlier conversation, support is potentially active listening and sure. sending a resource to somebody. We can be a support to someone with actually being in solidarity with them, which is a more active role of trying to, to change the world for them based on how they describe their lived experience. Thanks, Councillor Vasek. Other comments? Nope, seeing none. All right, well. I, I just wanted to push on two, if that's okay. I have two more that I just had questions about. And you'll see, you'll see the ones where we were sort of like, oh, this is interesting, but what do we do with it? Intergenerational is really an interesting word. And we've grouped it with enabling all ages, but I don't think that's what the writer, I assume that's not what's exactly meant there. If the, if the person who wrote intergenerational is, is comfortable sharing, I'd love to under, better understand what you mean underneath that. Oh, yeah, it does. It does partly get eight to eight and eighty communities. Although, and I've said it here, I feel like I'm a broken record about this a bit. But like um, about eight and eighty communities, with the lower end of eight not really capturing the eight years before that, which is actually the harder time than eight years old because I have an eight year old. It's much easier to navigate the city with him than it is to navigate with my two year old. <clears throat> Snow corners, <laughs> and so. Um, so, so that's all I'll say about 8 and 80. So it does kind of include 8 and 80 communities, but it's also like, um, it's also about um, zoning and it's about um, some of the, like, you know, intergener people living intergenerationally, like some of those models where seniors live with younger folks and, yeah, okay. and about people being able to age in place like someone was talking about earlier. So... Um, so, so yeah, it is eight and 80, but also about how different generations also connect and then how are we connected to future generations we might not even know and, and how does that guide our decision-making now? I'm glad I pushed. Thank you. I was just to add to that, I, um, cause I don't know if you were in the chambers when, um, cause part of what our discussion was, sorry, around, um, some of the housing issues is that people can grow up in a neighborhood and then not be able to find another place to live in that neighborhood because it's all single family homes and there's not that diversity of housing in that. Yeah. So I think that's maybe what you were meaning, correct? Yeah. Partly, I mean, in, yeah. partly part, what yeah. she was meaning. Yeah. No, it's great. I'm glad. I thank, thank you, Mayor. And that's part of why I pushed on that one because I did feel like there was a good undercurrent of it's a, it's a bit of a bundled of thoughts, which is great because so, we've got the notes from that now. 
I, I could I could ask about a few more, but I recognize that we're running up on time, and you've already had a very long day. So um, I think oh, it's, good. I think it's okay <laughs> if okay. you want to ask. I, a couple I only more. I only have two more that I just really wanted to push on. One was we had leadership and leader on the other page, which is vision and your north star. Everyday leaders is interesting, and this may go back down back to where Councillor Hammer, you were taking us a little bit of the it's for the corporation and we but is that i don't know if you wrote it but is is what did you write it i wrote it uh, yeah. it was a good guess this well time done. Okay. Well done. yeah no i did i did write it because i have a i have a strong 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 belief that each and every person regardless of what their job may be is a leader in their own right okay, and great. so it to me it em encompasses everything from empowering the um our support workers, empowering our volunteers, all the way up to empowering the CAO to do certain things okay. that it's not by title that we are leaders. It's because we're taking the initiative. We're showing some imagination. We're continuously improving yeah. things. It's, it's all of those kind of pieces that yeah. comes to me. So it's more I than just that. leadership. It's all of us. Uh, yeah. Please go ahead, Mayor. No, I, lo I love that. We, we have a saying where we work of leadership at every level, and it's the same construct. It's the idea that it doesn't matter whether you're a consultant or a partner, like there are things you should be stepping up and taking taking the full authority of your role in whatever your role is, right? And everybody can do that. I, lo I, I love that. So that was one. The other one that I just, I wanted to just pull a little bit apart was just the, um, how the responsiveness, because it's the first time it came up, responsiveness and democratically engaged. Like I understand it obviously on the top line, like you were an elected group of, rep you're a group of elected representatives, but underneath that, when you think about guiding principles for the corporation, I don't know who wrote it, but if you just wanted to give us a little bit more, what was underneath your thinking there, that would be super helpful. Sure. So um, that was me that wrote that one. And um, I see responsiveness as being part of uh, transparency and accountability. Um, so whether that is, um, you know, like in the in the context of economic justice or fiscal responsibility, um, we have a responsibility to our community members to get things right. And part of that is um, doing democratic engagement to its fullest extent that we can at the municipal level. That's great. No, I'm, again, really glad I pushed because I wouldn't have pulled that necessarily myself. That's awesome. Thank you. So we, we, I think we do a last call on this page. If there's anybody else who wants to speak to any of theirs, and then we'll, okay, we'll sort last, of push on to the close a little bit. Last call, council. Any? Yeah. So go ahead, council, right? I put up one last word that really bugs me, but I, the fact that I put it up speaks to, I think, my values coming into this role, and it's prudent. Um, I like to say in my other job, work smarter, not harder. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so important when you have very big constraints, you need to be very, very strategic yep. in what you do. So it, it's like a shrewdness, a practicality okay. that has to be matched with the bold and ambitious. That's great. Well, no, and it, and it speaks back to what you were just talking about in terms of responsive, which is your, your constituents will be expecting it's a tough time in the world as we've discussed already. And so there is, a, there'll be an expectation that you're being prudent, I think. And so I think it, it behooves you to, to think that through in all of what you do. I think that's great. That makes a lot of sense. And if you. I could just add a little bit to that, Please. I think that, that, um, that prudent that as uh, Councillor Wright described it, um, you know, when you think also about our need for, to be bold and ambitious because there's big challenges out there you know it's that we're not going to get there by ourselves like this is not just mm. it's not just us here <laughs> um, in the city reminder. like yeah the corporation it's us with the community in partnership um, doing these things that, that's great and I don't actually think we have that merit ca captured in that way on here so we'll take the note but it's a really good reminder you you're not a sole operator in, much, in most of what you do. And so remembering that, that you're, and you can breed boldness and ambition in a prudent way through your community as well. Is, it's a great way to, to, to summarize it. So that's, that's great. All right. Yeah. We're just closing okay. Out, yeah. yeah. So, um, okay, great. So thank you all for your, 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 uh, for your uh, input in these last uh, couple of exercises. And so we'll hand it back to Sandy just to go through next steps. But just uh, before we do that, I just want to thank you for the last, uh, for the last time we were here as well as this time. Great input. We'll take all this away, obviously. And as we said last time, make more beautiful statements. And um, well, maybe oh, yeah. maybe a closing thought. As as beautiful statements come back, I uh, the one thing I always say in every strategic planning exercise I've ever done in my career is 
Strategy is what you do. It's not what you say. And I've really heard that undercurrent in the conversation today, Mayor. And I think it's a really, it's a really, really good reminder. And this group has really brought that forward in a lot of that comments. But I encourage all of you to absolutely get the words right. But the words that you can do, and I see so much of the commentary being like, we have to get to work now. I, I really appreciate that that commentary. And I just you could get hung. I've seen people get hung up for weeks and weeks and weeks on getting the perfect words, but it sounds like the the right action is what's underneath this for everyone. And I think that's really encouraging, and and I would that, that you're very much on the right track. So that's great. Thank you very Cheers. much. Thank you. Hand it back, to Sandy, just to close this out. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't realize that was. Uh, you're completely done. Thank you very much, <laughs> both of you, for <laughs> for leading us through that. I think it's those are really uh, interesting and evocative conversations and discussions. So. Appreciate, uh, appreciate what you're bringing to the table and helping us walk through this. Perfect. Well, I'm going to say thank you again to Deloitte. I love that our biggest challenge today was watching you try to sort all those post-it notes, which is a good problem to have. So um, thank you to Deloitte for leading us through today's session. Just in terms of some really quick next steps, uh, we're looking at commencing official staff engagement this week, which is really exciting. Uh, we are finishing up some ongoing engagement opportunities across the community uh, through to the end of March. April 1st is our, again, our free public skate at Rim Park uh, from two to four uh, with a focus on youth engagement as part of our strategic plan. April 3rd, I will be back here at council uh, to present the scan report as well as a presentation. And that will be a summary of all the scan inputs that we've received up to and including the end of February, as well as some of the engagement that's taken place as well. And then, of course, our draft strategic plan uh, will be delivered to Council on May 8th and the final plan on June 26th. And so in terms of, of closing remarks, I look forward to working with all of you, our community staff, and Deloitte, of course, um, over the next few months to create a plan that allows us to be strong, sustainable together. Thank you. Yeah, just one second. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Councillor Bodley. There's a comment or question. Sorry, I just had a question about uh, the next the next steps here. Uh, is there after the draft plan comes out, is there the intention to have that go to some of our advisory committees to get feedback? Because I know there's some appetite already from some. Yeah, so thank you for that reminder. We're actually meeting with the advisory committees this week um, in terms of kind of getting some initial feedback for, from them as part of this process. And then once the draft plan is, is tabled with council, obviously it will be included as part of a draft, as part of a staff report. So we will be reaching out to those that engaged with us on the strategic plan um, in a really concerted effort to follow back up with them and say, you know, is this, are we heading in the right direction? Under Understanding that we're not able to capture everything as part of the words, but is the intent there? And so, yes, throughout the month of May, I'm just working out some final dates with Deloitte as to how much time we're going to have, but we're trying to work it into the timeline to provide as much time as possible for that review to happen internally, for it to happen externally, as well as all of the work that our Indigenous Initiatives Anti-Racism Accessibility and Equity team, they are doing amazing work, and I can't wait to come back to council in April to talk about what we're hearing. I was fortunate to be part of a session last week. We had over 50 people in a tiny little community center come out uh, from equity deserving groups to let us know the type of community they want for Waterloo. So really excited to follow back up with the community across the community as part of that draft plan. And again, we won't be able to capture everything, but we're really, really hopeful and working really closely with Deloitte to ensure that the intent is there as part of your new strategic plan. Great, thank you so much. Did you have a follow-up, Councillor? No, anyone else? Yeah, I'm really excited to hear that there was 50 people out, um, whatever uh, whatever date that was last week. That's, uh, yeah, I think looking really forward to, to getting that input as well as the other scans and the other information that you're pulling together. So lots still to do, but we know you're up to the task. So, <laughs> um, so with that, I will look for um, uh, someone to move and second the strategic plan council workshop number three. Uh, Councillor Vasek, moved by Councillor Vasek and seconded uh, by Councillor Rowe. All in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you very much, Sandy, and thank you to the team from Deloitte for your work on this, continuing work on this.
Okay, so moving on to um, agenda item 10, consideration of notice of motions given at previous meetings. There are none. There are no notice of motions. Number 12, communi communications and correspondence. There's a letter of permission to Larviside Region of Waterloo Public Health West Nile Virus Program. Um, we need a, a mover and a seconder for the mayor to sign the, this letter of permission. Um, moved by Councillor Bodley, seconded by Councillor Wright. All in favor, that is carried. Thank you. Um, any unfinished, it says there's no unfinished business. Any questions from council on anything? Seeing none. Um, new business. Is, is there anything anyone from council wants to raise? Questions, comments in terms of new business? I'll just say um, it is officially now spring, so about an hour ago. So, <laughs> yes, so uh, yeah, not that it looks like it outside, but it is officially spring. Councillor Rowe. Oh, just a second. Um, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to um, bring to Council's um, attention that um, Community Coalition on Refugee and Immigrant Concerns hosts World Refugee Day Waterloo Region every year in June. And we um, are putting out a call for nominations for volunteers in the community who have contributed to the su success of refugees settling in the region, as well as newcomers who have contributed to um, the region through their time and um, energy. So um, that can be found at www.ccorica.ca um, slash World Refugee Day. And if you have any other questions, I can give you more information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Rowe. Anyone else have? No? Okay, thank you. Um, so number 16, enactment of bylaws. There's uh, three recommendations that the bylaws listed below be read a first, second, and third time, and finally passed. Do I need to read this whole thing or just... No, okay. I need a mover and a seconder then. Councillor, moved by Councillor Hamner, seconded by Councillor Rowe. All in favor? That is approved. Um, and finally, adjournment. Moved by Councillor Rowe, seconded by Councillor Wright. All in favor? That is unanimously approved. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening.